All right, so here we are. Uh, welcome back, folks. Here we are in the um, course on bioethical issues at the beginning of human life in the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning, as always, with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, Ariana, unless you have a comment or a question, maybe you can mute your mic while you make your way in. Okay, thank you. So, welcome back. I know it's touch and go, but uh, we should be having lecture this uh, Saturday and next Saturday also. I think we're still good then. So this is the fifth lecture, right, on the course. And uh, next week is the sixth and last lecture on the course. <laughs> and then in two weeks, we start the next course, which is at the other end of life, uh, bioethical issues at the end of human life or toward the end of human life. And you see some similarities there, basically the whole issue of principle bioethics, right? But then uh, uh, quite a few differences also between uh, the bioethical issues at the beginning or at the end of human life. And just to give a little tantalizer for the next course, mm, whereas at the beginning of human life, we start with how many cells? That's a real question. One, and the name of that cell from the Greek? Anybody? Go on. Zygote, zygote, and it's universal, right? Yeah. Because this is scientific life. Remember, in principle bioethics, we begin with nature. Nature tells us the facts of life, right? There is nature occurring right now outside these walls, whether we want it or not, whether we understand it or not, whether we agree with it or not. There is a very complex, dynamic uh, nature occurrence on the other side of this wall that we call life, organically speaking. And if we had to reduce life to one word, Biologically speaking, what would be that word? Just trying to get the neurons going here, get the train started. One word to uh, define life, organically speaking, as it's occurring outside and inside this, the wall too, because <laughs> we are certainly alive, right? You can only use one word. Metabolism. Bingo. And so, I mean, this is relevant because we're now into space. Right, and we have a number of probes out there that are looking for life, extra planetary life outside of planet Earth within our solar system. We got four minor planets, we got four major planets, and even outside our solar system, and even in moons. Recently, there was in the news, not a week goes by, that one of the moons, uh, I forget where it is, but a moon that is so large that it's maybe half the size of the Earth, <laughs> okay? But it's a moon. In other words, it's orbiting around a planet that itself is orbiting around the sun. So figure that complexity. This moon was spilling out a huge, huge geyser of water, right? Of liquid water into space. Imagine how huge that plume is that to be detected by some kind of radar that we have out there. I don't know if it was the Webb, the James Webb, or one of these. Uh, machines that we have out in space. So, I mean, liquid water, bam, that goes right away. Well, that's the possibility for organic life, <laughs> right? And so would we recognize the life if we see it in another planet, another moon, another solar system? You know, would we recognize it? If the thing is metabolizing, <laughs> then we could possibly say it's life, all right? But would we recognize the metabolism? Would we recognize the complex chemical reactions that make up metabolism? Remember, metabolism is subdivided into two parts. First of all, metabolism is an ordered. Why, Why is metabolism defining life? Because life goes against entropy. What is entropy? I'm into single words this morning. 
what happens to heat? When you hear entropy, think about heat. What happens to heat? It radiates, right? Heat radiates from a core, from the origin of the heat out in all possible directions that are available for the heat, unless there's a heat shield, it's not gonna go that way. But if there's no heat shield in, in principle, it would radiate three dimensionally out. In fact, four dimensionally, because what's the fourth dimension? Are we at the same place that uh, when the lecture started? Yes. So are we at the same place that when the lecture started? No. Yes and no. Locally, we are in this classroom, right? No one has shifted desks <laughs> since we started. So locally, yes. So in what sense, professor? In what sense? What's the frame of reference? So locally, yes. And even regionally within St. Thomas University, within uh, the Dade County, within the peninsula of Florida. But if we zoom out into space and look at the peninsula of Florida rotating an average of every 24 hours, one day, right? All right, that's a long distance. That's about, I think it's 6,000. Where, where, what's the speed of rotation of the Earth? What's the fastest thing moving on Earth? The Earth itself. About 6,000 miles per hour. 6,000 miles per hour. OK. <laughs> That's uh, pretty fast. <laughs> Why don't we fly out into space? <laughs> because the atmosphere is holding us, gravity is holding us, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, uh, so we're returning pretty fast, which means that we're no longer at the same spot we were in reference to an outside observer, like the ISS, the International Space Station, looking down. Oh, they moved. Now the classroom is uh, away. So. Uh, yes and no, it depends on time, right? And therefore that fourth dimension, third and fourth uh, time and place, that um, that amalgam, amalgam, amalgamation in the, between time and space. Uh, so why that? Let's zoom back in to... Um... Entropy. Yes, entropy, thank you. So radiation, right? It's a, um, heat radiates. And as it radiates, it dissipates. It depends if I'm close to the stove or far away from the stove, right? Whether I feel more heat close to the stove or far away, less, less heat. But it's the same heat that is radiating. How come I don't feel as much heat when I'm further from the stove? Dissipation of heat. And that happens in the universe. So it happens with the sun, it happens with the solar, with all the stars and millions of galaxies that are around. So anyway, there is a dissipation of heat into the universe. And that heat, which is a type of energy, is wasted. It's not available for doing work. It's not available for doing work. If we harness the heat, like boiling water, for example, we get steam and with the steam we can do what? rotate a motor and generate electricity, right? A power plant. But that's harnessing the heat. If the heat is dissipating, it's unavailable for work. And therefore that's entropy. It's an increase in disorder, an increase in disorder. And it's a gradual, continuous decrease in disorder for how long? Since the Big Bang, right? Since the Big Bang, Singularity, explosion outward. And so the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang, not only in matter, but also in energy. And that energy, mostly the heat, is being dissipated and it's lost. It's unavailable for work. And therefore, and that's entropy, it's an increase in disorder, disorder. All right. So whenever we have order, it's going diametrically opposed to. Entropy to the second law of thermodynamics. It's a little similar to medicine, what was, what was the, the law of thermodynamics, right? Oh, okay. Entropy is an increase in order, it's, a, it's a, an increase in disorder. But life is order because there are chemical reactions under very controlled conditions. And think about it, there's heat involved, right? Because in metabolism, 
So metabolism is subdivided into two parts. What are the two parts functionally? Think functional. Metabolism. Of metabolism, yes. So what is, give me an example of metabolism. We can talk about, yeah, so we can talk about two levels of metabolism at the organismic level or at the cellular level, right? The largest and the smallest level of metabolism. The largest level of metabolism is the organism as a whole, everything that occurs what? Within the envelope, which is the skin, the integumentary system, right? Including the skin, because the skin is also metabolizing. So that's at the level of the whole organism. And so digestion, respiration, thinking, all that is metabolic processes. Thinking is an organic process that involves synthesis of proteins in a lightning speed. As we're thinking right now, I could not articulate any thought if my brain, not the mind, that the brain did not synthesize proteins at a lightning speed to put it through the synaptic network of, of uh, neurons to generate a thought. <laughs> so a, th a thought has an organic basis to it. That, that's why dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all things affect the, main, the brain and the mind. They affect the mind because they affect the brain, <laughs> okay? And so if the, if the car has no motor, it's going nowhere. If the car has no gasoline, it's going nowhere. <laughs> So there's this organic, there's this material foundation to thought and even spiritual thought, even to a prayer, which is totally, absolutely spiritual, but not absolutely. And there has to be a, a protein synthesis in our brain to allow us to pray. It's amazing. <laughs> Why? You know, the likelihood of this happening is that it shouldn't happen. It should, because it's order, it's tremendous amount of order that is occurring. And that order, we, we summarize it in the word metabolism. So metabolism has two parts to it, either building up organic compounds or breaking down organic compounds, right? Into their building blocks. What does digestion do with a juicy steak that I just ate and swallowed almost whole because I was so greedy about the taste that I just chomp it down and swallowed it. I was very hungry and just, it went down into the stomach. What happens at the stomach? The level of the stomach of the food is broken down. Yes, acid. mostly acid, very. Digestible Yes, exactly. So that chunk of steak landed in my stomach at a pH of about what? About 1.5 or two, it's sulfuric acid. You know, it's concentrated sulfuric. If I pour concentrated sulfuric acid here on the table, you start making a hole through it, all right? Concentrated sulfuric acid is in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Those are the peptidic enzymes. They work in the high pH, uh, in, a, in a very low pH, actually, high acidity. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we get the reflux, it's called what? Heartburn, it feels like the heart is burning. The heart is fine. There's nothing wrong with the heart. Heartburn is uh, mm, gastric juices that are refluxing up through the pylorus, the little valve that uh, closes the esophagus. And some of those juices come up through the esophagus and start digesting away the inside of the esophagus, which is not used to that pH. So we're self-digesting the esophagus and that's very painful because that has it, it should not be there. So we need to drink water and milk, especially to emulsify it and to neutralize it and get it back down where it's supposed to go. All right. So when you have a big meal, don't lay down horizontally because that can come back out, reflux. Uh, so you see, everything has this organic basis to it, but metabolism is building up or breaking down. The digestive process at the organismal level breaks down the food into its basic components. So what are the basic building blocks of protein? A steak is mostly protein, right? It's got lipids also. It's got some carbohydrates, but it's mostly protein and lipids. What breaks down the protein? The peptidic enzymes that we have in our stomach breaks it down into what? At least polypeptides, which are uh, subunits of, um, of um, uh, proteins, but even further down from the polypeptides, Exactly. Of which there are how many in nature? 20. That's not, come on, 20. Remember the, the genetic? 
you stay with it, you stay, you're in the race, you're still in the race. <laughs> okay, so there are about 20. Remember the genetic code, redundancy, 64 triplets, code for 20 amino acids, the 20 amino acids are in nature. They're, uh, GNC and all these companies that sell you stuff, what are they selling you? They're selling you the, the purified amino acids, right? As part of the nutritional supplement. If you have a healthy meal, and you eat normal healthy food of the three main groups or whatever, you don't need any extra stuff, right? Maybe when we get older, we may need some extra stuff, the, the multivitamins and all that, but basically the nutrients are in the food. But the intestines are gonna uh, not gonna absorb a piece of steak or a string bean, right? That needs to be broken down into the basic nutrients. Now we're down to the molecular level, the mush. That's why it's very important to chew our food, especially the carbohydrates. Why the carbohydrates? Who digests the carbohydrates? Hmm? We're going down to the mitochondria. <laughs> yes, yes, mitochondria. We'll get to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is there in the background, waiting, waiting for it's all this to happen. It's yeah. It's yes, yes, for for metabolism, right? Because it's the gasoline of of the cell. But uh, carbohydrates, since we're in the food and digestion and chewing stuff, carbohydrates are digested in the mouth with a pH of what? About 7.5 or eight. So it's basic, it's on the other side of the scale. You know, pH of about eight, why? Because the enzyme that digests the carbohydrates, which is mostly amylase, it's in the saliva, salivary glands, make that enzyme. All enzymes are proteins, right? Okay, so the enzyme that digests carbohydrates is in the mouth, it's in the saliva, and uh, th we have to chew the carbohydrates, like uh, bread and uh, especially spaghetti, because if we don't chew the spaghetti well, and we swallow it, it's gonna come out in little chunks, <laughs> because after the, think about it again, functionally, we have the bolus, the bolus is uh, whatever we chewed up, right? And that mush, goes down into the stomach. The ideal is that it would go down to the stomach like what? Like something coming out of the blender. <laughs> that would be the ideal, to chew your food so well that there's no longer any taste on it. <laughs> you send it down to the stomach because once that bolus hits the stomach, the pH changes radically, drastically. So what happens to amylase? Dead, gone, de uh, denatured, no longer functional. So that's the end of carbohydrate digestion. See, now it's protein digestion in the stomach. So it's kind of three stages, carbohydrate digestion in the mouth, protein digestion in the stomach, and then that time now is pushed further down the tube into the intestines, small intestine. And the small intestine is small, why? Because it's very short? No, it's quite the opposite. The large intestine is very short. I think maybe about six or eight feet. But the small intestine, the small intestine is between 25 to 30 feet. So that's, that's from here to the wall, all right? But it's small in diameter or smaller in diameter than the large intestine. So it's about the diameter thing. Again, functionally, not the length, all right? The length is very long because then it's the intestine when stuff is absorbed. Stuff meaning the basic nutrients like amino acids, they're small molecules, they're organic molecules, but they're small, tiny, right? And that, the intestines absorb that, but before they do the absorption, there's still one group of organic compounds that needs to be digested. Of the, of the three main, what are the four, four main groups of organic compounds? Proteins, carbohydrates, fats, fats or there's a more elegant term to it. Lipids, right? Because it also includes oils, greases, so and waxes. So it's lipids and nucleic acids, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, which also get digested now. Okay, uh, because certainly when we eat a piece of steak, that steak is formed by tissue, muscle tissue, and that muscle tissue has nuclei, has cells, and those cells have nuclei, and those nuclei have DNA. And that DNA also gets digested down, all right? Uh, for the basic, what are the four basic uh, uh, components of DNA or RNA? 
the nucleotides, right? The nucleotides and our cells, which synthesize DNA and RNA, need the four nucleotides to be provided, the five nucleotides, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil. They need those building blocks to build the DNA or the RNA, just like they need the 20 amino acids to build the proteins and the lipids, right? Now, in contrast to proteins and nucleic acids, and, uh, and carbohydrates that are mostly water soluble. In fact, they're hydrated. That's mostly the function of that hydrogen, the hydrogen that coats these, these organic molecules, right? Um, they are water soluble. In contrast to those three groups, the lipids are generally non soluble in water. So we call them hydrophobic instead of hydrophilic, right? And so the lipids are not digested in the mouth. They're not digested in the stomach. What's the next alternative, functionally, than the tube? The beginning of the small intestine, right? And that's where a little tube empties that is coming from where? And this gland is encased, kind of encased, shrouded by the liver the gallbladder, which produces bile. And the bile is sent to the small intestine through the bile, bile duct. You've heard about gallbladder stones, right? They can be large, they're smooth, unlike the, the ones in the kidneys that have spikes. And they can sit there and there, unless they block the tube, there's no inflammation. Many of us have gallbladder stones, so we don't even know about it. <laughs> it's okay. Mm, as long as they don't block the tube. If they block the tube, then the bladder, the, the gallbladder, not the bladder bladder, urinary bladder, but the gallbladder gets inflamed and that's uh, a health uh, risk. So people who have uh, taken out their gallbladder, they have difficulty digesting fats. So they have to eat a low fat diet, right? But anyway, normal, the, the bile goes there and the bile, what bile does is a, a series of salts and minerals and chemicals, it emulsifies, it emulsifies the lipids so that the enzymes can work on those lipids. So an emulsification is like taking uh, water to this experiment. Well, in your mind, we can do thought experiments at no cost, <laughs> right? Without ruining or breaking anything. Take a blender, we have a blender, we put water in the blender, just whatever, tap water, and then we're gonna add oil. And what's gonna happen? Separation, you got an oil layer, you got a water layer, which is gonna be on top and which on the bottom, by the way. It's on top, yeah, it's just like oil and vinegar, you can see the same thing. The, the vinegar is on the bottom because it's hydrophilic, right? It's water-based, but the oil is on top. It means that it's less dense. Oil is actually less dense than water, it's interesting. Anyway, now we turn on the blender, the highest speed, what's gonna to happen to that oil and water? They're gonna mix into microscopic droplets, right? And that's an emulsification. And it's gonna look kind of opaque, kind of a white milky color, right? That's an emulsification. Uh, if we pour it quickly, we should have done it with vinegar and oil so we can pour it on the salad. <laughs> but it's the same basic thing. We pour it quickly on the salad, then the emulsification stays, right? In fact, uh, when you read the label of all these uh, dressings, uh, salad dressings, they have emulsifiers. That emulsifier is precisely uh, molecules that are amphiphatic. In other words, they have a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side, the oil, latches onto the hydrophobic side and the um, water or liquids uh, hang onto the hydrophilic side and has, you have the whole complex together, um, similar to the cell membrane. Anyway, <clears throat> what happens with the emulsification, if you use it quickly, it stays emulsified. But if you let that blender sit for a while, over time, the little droplets will separate again. You know, there's a thermodynamic going on there. Uh, or that will separate again and eventually we'll get the oil on top and the water on the bottom or the vinegar on the bottom. And they go back to their natural state of hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Uh, 
and why all that. Anyway, oh yeah, so the lipids get digested with the action of bile into it that emulsifies it in the intestines, all right? And eventually, um, then it goes through the rest of the 30 feet of tubing. And by that time, hopefully all of the organic compounds have been broken down into the basic components of protein, lipids, and carbohydrates down to the smaller, like simple sugars, you know, um, a monosaccharide or a disaccharide and so forth which are easily absorbed because it has to go through the walls of the intestine, which is very thin. Mm -hmm. uh, you ever eat, um, it's similar to hot dog, but it's more tasty. Chor chorizo, what do you say chorizo in English? <laughs> so sorry, sausage, every eat sausage, nice sausage. And the sausage is encased, right? In kind of a skin. And in fact, it's called the, what's it called? I think it's called the encasement or something like that, the casing. That thin skin of the sausage, that is small intestine, <laughs> usually from the same pig. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it's been cleaned out a lot, of course, and, and cleansed, right? And that what encases the uh, sausages is um, is intestines. So you make a little knot on it, you pour the roundup pig inside. And then when you get the size that you want, you make a little, little knot and then another chorizo, another sausage and so forth, you make the whole link. But that's that's a small intestine, so it's very thin. And um, the nutrients then have to go through the intestines into the circulatory system for the whole body for nutrition. And so the intestines are highly vascularized. They have a lot of capillaries around it, right? For absorption of, um, of the nutrients. Anyway, my point is that that is digestion at the organismic level. So it's a process, digestion is essentially catabolism, right? It's breaking down, but it's an orderly breaking down. You can see there are basically three stages. And again, think functionally, the different structures of the body are designed for the proper function. So the function of the mouth is to digest carbohydrates. The function of the stomach is to digest the proteins and the function of the intestines first, to digest the lipids and then to absorb all the nutrients that are available. Finally, mostly at the small and at the large intestine, what does the large intestine do? Because that marsh that is going through, which is called chyme, chyo, still has a lot of water. It's very hydrated for all these reactions to occur. Chemical reactions typically they occur in, in water, all right? And that's why water is the universal solvent and so forth. Mm. The large intestines absorb water. And that finally makes the, uh, uh, the fecal matter uh, solid enough to be emptied out, all right? So water is also absorbed by the body and used by the body. If we don't absorb water, we dehydrate because we're giving off water through our pores all the time, through the skin. We evaporate water even when we don't realize we lose a lot of water. Plus we lose water in respiration also. We lose a lot of water through the lungs, exhale. Mm -hmm. So um, that's at the organismal level. We can make an analogous argument when we go down to the cellular level and we talk about cellular metabolism. Only that at the cellular level is not just catabolism, but it's also what? The building up of organic compounds that are used for the cell to function. I mentioned enzymes. Where does, where does the amylase come from? Salivary glands. And those glands are made up of salivary tissue. And the tissue, the salivary tissue is made up of cells, salivary cells. So those salivary cells which are specialized, most of the cells in our body are specialized, right? Neurons think, salivary cells make amylase, <laughs> etc. Bone marrow makes blood. So cells, most of the cells in our body are specialized. They make the product that is needed functionally for that organ to function properly. So the cells that make up the salivary glands make among many other things, they make this protein, 
that is called what? Amylase. It's an enzyme that digests the carbohydrates. Okay, that's not made by the the inner lining of the stomach. The fundus of the stomach doesn't make amylase. It makes what? Peptidic proteins. Peptidic proteins that digest uh, protein. Right. So. <clears throat> Each part of the body has its own function. And in the in at the cellular level, there is catabolism, but there's also anabolism, the building up of molecules of organic molecules for that cell to function and for the tissue to function and for the organ to function and therefore for the entire organism to function. So imagine the choreography. It's a very elegant uh, symphony that is occurring. <laughs> All right, where all the instruments play their part at different time. Mm -hmm. And they make a harmonious full sound. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, so anabolism and catabolism, but when you think about anabolism and catabolism functionally, their ordered reaction is not chaotic. It has to be ordered. It has to be sequential. One thing has to follow the other. For the ribosomes to work, what happens at the ribosomes? What do they do? They make what? Ribosomes in the cell? No, no. Amino acids, proteins, right? Ribosomes, they make the proteins. They read the RNA, the mRNA, messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is coming from where? The nucleus. It was transcribed from the DNA, which never needs the nucleus. So in other words, if the ribosome never got a messenger RNA, there's no protein to be had. The ribosomes can be perfectly intact in every cell of our body, but if there's no mRNA, they're doing nothing. There's no protein to be made. And there's no mRNA without the DNA to function properly and to transcribe. So you see, it's a very ordered reaction. It's amazing that in the trillions of cells in our body, this is occurring right now all the time. And particularly since we're talking and you're hopefully understanding what I'm saying, you know, that is intelligible to you in English because you know English, the chemical reactions that are happening in our brain right now at lightning speed is just bewildering. It's just incredible. And it's all ordered, it's not chaotic because we can understand each other in a particular language of the six or 7,000 languages that exist on earth. Hmm? So really the chances of that happening, the likelihood of all that happening statistically is it approaches zero, you know? It's like infinitesimal uh, un, unlikely that all this would happen. Because why? Because of entropy, because the general rule is disorder, is going toward dissipating heat, and so information is lost. Mm -hmm. But no, life is a counter eddy. Uh, it, it's, it's diametrically opposed to, to entropy, all right? And what I said that is similar to medicine, why? To the practice of medicine. Again, in the big picture, what does medicine do? What does a doctor and a nurse do, please? They try to heal the patient, right? They try to heal the patient, right? But why is the patient sick? Well, the patient is sick because it's a weaker individual in the population one way or another, or had bad luck, I got it was maybe very strong, but uh, was hit by lightning. <laughs> you know, so there's chance involved too. But in general, the people who get uh, sick, generally, this is a general statement, are the weaker individuals in a population, all right? And that's natural selection, right? The weaker are selected out. So really, when we think about it, we put the practice of medicine in the context of natural selection, the practice of medicine is actually making the human population weaker or the species because it is enabling the weaker, especially if it occurs before and during the reproductive years. 
because after the reproductive years, who cares, right? They're not going to pass on the weakness. But if the weakness is in their genes, right? Variants, number of variants. If the weakness is in the genes, then by enabling this child or this teenager or this young adult to survive the weakness and that uh, individual procreates, then that weakness may be passed on. So really the practice of medicine goes against natural selection. And still we should do it, right? First of all, not everyone has uh, access to, to medical practice throughout the whole world. It's actually very few privileged individuals who have access to uh, quality healthcare. But aside from that argument, assuming that medicine was practiced throughout the whole world, we should still do it. Why? Because of benevolence. We may will the good. We have the capacity to will the good. No other animal is benevolent, you know. A, a lion, when it's hunting down the zebra, is going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, you're the young of this mother zebra. Uh, I apologize, I'm not going to hunt you down. No, the lion is going to hunt down the zebra, <laughs> okay? No matter what, because of instinct. So there's no benevolence in nature. Nature is actually very, from our perspective, kind of cruel. <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if the creature doesn't survive, it's going to get eaten up. So we have the capacity for good, for doing good, for healing the sick. And because of benevolence, we should do it. Because we have the capacity to do it, then we should do it. It is an ethical argument. It's, it's a bioethical argument. So benevolence leads to beneficence, which is to do the good. Benevolere is to will the good, right? Benevolere and benefacere, benefacere, to do the good. Because we can will the good, then we should do the good, which is the practice of medicine. And also the practice of education, because if no one teaches us anything, we'd be like little animals behaving like wild animals. If no one taught us how to how to uh, speak and, and read and write, you know, it takes a language to think. <laughs> we have to think in a language. And so if no one teaches us a language, we can't think. We, we behave instinctively like little like uh, animals mm -hmm. and so I had to make the effort to do that and in fact we have a whole institution in society that is called education <laughs> required by many countries very civilized countries in the world not only primary but even secondary education right for 12 years uh, so this issue of metabolism is really quite fascinating when we think about it. And would we recognize metabolism in another planet or moon if we were to see it? Because it may not be carbon-based, right? So remember our organic molecules need to have two elements. And by the way, as far as we can tell, the elements on the periodic table that you see right there, right? Those elements are universal, really literally of the entire universe. So, so far from what we can tell, and how can we tell? Because we haven't really sampled. We have sampled the moon. I don't think we sample, I don't even know if we sample some of Mars soil. I think it's getting ready to be. They, they were able, one of the, I think we have two rovers, two uh, jeeps going around Mars, right? And uh, one, mm, a few months ago, was able finally to get some samples. And uh, it may be on the way back to Earth, but uh, I don't know that we sample actual uh, Mars soil yet, but we have certainly the moon. Plus there's the asteroids that come in from who knows where and we sample those, right? Of all the stuff, extraterrestrial material matter that we've sampled, anything outside of the periodic table, any element, any new element? No, nothing that we sample that has come from out of the planet. Certainly there's nothing in the planet that we have discovered yet that is not an element in the table. Yes, I'm talking about nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, uh, argon, gold, uh, uranium, you know, the whole thing, cesium, uh, lead, etc. the whole table. We haven't discovered any other element that is not in the table, either on Earth or outside of Earth yet. Okay, there could be, but it's unlikely. 
And it's mostly by the light spectrum, by the emission uh, spectrum that these uh, radars, that these uh, satellites machines detect on, uh, on other um, planets. But anyway, uh, so our life on planet Earth organically is based on organic compound, to be an organic compound of those four groups, right? To be an organic compound, we need at least two elements. Two, just two elements, which are what? Okay, think of a carbohydrate. It has what and what? Carbon and hydrogen, at least carbon and hydrogen. For it to be an organic compound, it needs carbon and hydrogen. Just two of the other. Hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. You can't get simpler than that because less than one is zero. <laughs> you have no element, right? And carbon is six. Six protons, six electrons. And so why is, uh, you see carbon over there? Right, the atomic number is in red. And that's the number of protons. And then the, the one below is the atomic mass, which is typically about twice. Because what makes the mass? The protons and? the neutrons, which don't have a charge, but they have a mass, right? They have weight. Uh, uh, so just two elements is the minimal for having life. <laughs> it's just incredible. We talk about reduction. Hmm? But it could be, it doesn't mean that in other planets, for example, life, organic life has to be carbon-based, like we say. It could be, for example, silicon base, which is has uh, silicon S I right on the carbon. You see it, fourteen. It's not S because S by itself is sulfur, is sixteen. But um, S I silicon has similar properties, similar atomic properties, and carbon. But it has a third shell. You see, it's on the third row. And therefore, it could be silicon base. So if we're looking for carbon out there, for carbohydrates, for, for organic compounds, it may not be a carbon-based life. It could be a silicon-based life, number one. Number two, metabolism, we're, we're used to really very fast metabolism, lightning fast, where these proteins are synthesized and broken down and so forth, and every other dynamic system that is going on right now. But it could be that extraterrestrial life, the metabolism is very slow. It doesn't take nanoseconds. It may take a year or two or a century or a millennium to synthesize a single product. So metabolism could be not carbon-based, and extremely slow. That means that for us, it may look just like a rock, <laughs> but it's actually a living thing because over millennia, that rock by itself is changing. <laughs> it's metabolized. Anyway, we've gone too far afield. Just, I think the motors are ready now. So mm, let's get into synaptic pruning. Um, yes, metabolism order is the whole thing that I want to talk about. So order, and it's a counter eddy to the big flow of disorder, which is uh, entropy. Now, yes, we're gonna talk about natural family planning. We're also gonna talk about uh, stem cell research and cloning, all right? But before that, I wanted to insert this thing about synaptic pruning because at this point, especially after talking about abortion, in vitro fertilization, and contraception. Talk about three hot items in today's society, right? Uh, and the stand on principle bioethics. I think it should be pretty obvious by now that it takes a, a certain level of maturity to be able to handle these topics and to deal with them in a mature way. So that if we recognize life at the level of the zygote and human life in a human zygote, then that zygote, he or she needs to be respected as anyone who is already born. And that has drastic consequences with regards to the other issues that we've talked about. 
Okay. And so it really does take maturity to uh, go there. And one definition of maturity is a gradual shift from being self-centered and other motivated to being self-motivated and other centered. Again, think functionally. For example, take a child. What does a child do? A baby does what? Cries and grabs, right? It's the oral phase. Everything goes into the mouth. <laughs> Whether it's edible or not, everything goes into the mouth because the baby wants to eat. Very biological, very simple, very organic. Whether it tastes good or bad, they want to eat. And when they don't eat, they cry. They cry for food, right? They're not crying for a lecture on uh, bioethics, <laughs> they cry for food. Very basic organic stuff, even before they can talk or really think rationally too much, they know they gotta survive. And so they cry. Uh, I've heard that one technique for mm, keeping the baby a little quiet while the food is coming is to flip the baby upside down and rock him or her. Uh, what are you doing by doing that? Yeah, you distract him, but also there's something happening biologically when you flip the baby upside down, face down, and you rock him or her in your arms, their belly is against uh, your arms. And so it's pushing a little bit on the stomach. And that pushing a little bit on the stomach gives a temporary relief of the hunger, <laughs> of, of the hunger desire. So I've tried that uh, in baptismal babies. The babies are coming up for baptism and the baptism is at 11 o'clock in the morning and that baby hasn't eaten since uh, eight o'clock in the morning. And so the baby's crying. <laughs> and I'm trying to conduct a, a, a ceremony here uh, when the baby crying. So I say, give me the baby for a little bit. I just rock him a little bit and the baby's temporarily quiet until we can pour some water on the baby. <laughs> so it's a little technique I learned in baptism. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so metabolism, right? Yes. The baby is self-centered, doesn't even have a full conscience, doesn't even have a self-identity. You have seen those little videos of a baby inside of, in front of a mirror? They think it's another one in, in the mirror. They're trying to get inside the mirror to play with the other kid in there that looks like them. You know, they don't even have self-identity yet. <laughs> it takes a while. I don't know, one, two, three, four years old. I don't know exactly when we become self-aware, but it's a gradual process. And at some point we do certainly become very self-aware, right? <laughs> and very self-centered. And so we go into the childhood and teenage years. And a lot of that time is about me, my and myself, the three that hang around together all the time, right? Me, my, and myself. And so it's self-centered, number one. Number two, basically to get kids to do something and even teenagers, you gotta what? You gotta bribe them. It's the carrot and the stick. You know, you reward the good behavior and you punish the bad behavior because they're external motivated. <laughs> they're motivated by stuff outside, all right? Wanna go to the movies? Well, eat all your food. When we were kids, my brother and I, we're just two, two brothers, I've told you. And when we were kids, um, we had to go to mass every Sunday. That was rule number one on Sundays, right? And uh, sometimes we wake up and we tell mom, oh, mom, I'm not feeling too well this morning. You know, I'm not feeling too well. Maybe I shouldn't go to mass. And my mother was a very intelligent human being. She was an architect and uh, uh, one of the first women architects in Cuba in the early part of the last century. And she would say, oh, I'm so sorry that you're feeling so bad today. That's okay. Well, if you're not feeling well enough to go to mass in the morning, you're not feeling well enough to go to the movies in the afternoon. And pretty soon we felt real great. <laughs> you see? So it's all about the external reward, okay? Or punishment. And so that's how we begin. And hopefully at some point as we go into adulthood, we make a shift from being self-motivated and other-centered, okay? And it's a gradual shift 
but the clock only moves in one direction and it's gradual. And thanks be to God that it's gradual because otherwise it just wouldn't happen. And it can, cannot happen right away precisely because the brain, I'm talking about the organ of the brain, is the one that takes longest to develop organically in the human body, you know. The next to the last are the reproductive organs, right? They take about a dozen years on average. Most vital organs are functioning even before we're born, like the digestive system has to be functioning in the embryo and the fetus because that fetus needs to metabolize <laughs> and it's getting food through the umbilical cord. That's the temporary alternative to the mouth. But the digestive system, the circulatory system is working in the in the embryo. What's one of the functional um, uh, systems that is not working, one of the vital systems that is not working in the fetus? Because he or she is being fed, including the oxygen, oxygenated blood, arterial blood from the mother. Respiratory system, fetus cannot breathe right? Inside, better not breathe. <laughs> it's going to breathe fluid. So the first breath, the breath of life, right? When the kid is born, has to take that first breath of life, and it comes with crying, of course. <laughs> so uh, that's when the uh, lungs begin to function, and they better function quickly for the rest of their lives. An average of 20 breaths per minute. 20 breaths per minute. <laughs> it's quite a bit. Hmm? All right, so, uh, but the reproductive organs take about a dozen years, more or less, to mature, okay? I mean, some mammals, I'm not talking about other lower animals, some mammals, they can mate almost a few weeks after they're born, okay? They born, they're born very mature. There's practically no adolescence there. <laughs> But we have a prolonged adolescence. Mm -hmm. And so it takes about a dozen years, more or less. But then there's another organ that takes twice as much, which is the brain. It takes about two dozen years to mature fully. And that's the synaptic pruning that I'm going to get to over here. So the brain takes, the human brain takes an average between, you know, what age, more or less? Say 12, 20 there. Yeah, <laughs> between 20 and 25, okay, years of age. Who got it right? What industry got this right from the get-go? The car insurance industry. When does the rate drop? 25, 25. I can tell that you've been paying for your children's uh, car insurance. <laughs> 25, the rate drops. But I'm the, okay, so when the when the Jesuits are saying, give me a child up to the age of seven. Yes. That's I'll the age of reason. Me. That's the beginning of the synaptic pruning. That's the, yes. That's the first level of development. Okay. All right. But that's the beginning. That's the basis. As Jesuits, they want to get it. They want to get the kid early on. Okay. Just like the communists. They want to get the kid early on, you know. Beginning seven years, six years, when do we start elementary school? Exactly. Indoctrination, right? Whether it's Jesuitic indoctrination or communistic indoctrination, you get the earlier the better. Okay. But the car insurance uses the upper limit, not the lower limit. And so statistically speaking, again, these are probabilities, right? Sadly, how many people in the US were 330 million people? Not everybody drives, but many do. And then on an average day, how many thousands of accidents don't we have in the US, right? Daily. And what's two things that is very well known is public record when that police officer goes over to the accident site and gets the driver's license. And it's got a name, a sex, and a date of birth. So they compile all that data, the insurance companies look at all the dates of birth, right? And they see that on average, after 25, there are fewer accidents. 
people or people with uh, older than 25 have fewer accidents on average than less than 25. Okay. And so they're taking the upper limit of this. It's be, the range is between 20 and 25. But synaptic pruning is very interesting and it's kind of counterintuitive. Look at this little guy here. This is what happens. Here's a little baby at birth, very few. So you understand that synapses. Okay, so gray matter, GM is gray matter, okay? And the brain is made up of basically two matters. One is gray and the other one is white, white matter. Now white is inside the brain and the gray is where? If it's not inside the brain, then it's on the periphery of the brain which is known also as the cortex, right? The brain cortex and word of thought happen. And also, by the way, feelings, sentiments, emotions, and, and thinking happens in the cortex. And that's why the convolutions of the brain, because when you take like the little piece of paper and you crump it up, right? You have the same surface, but in a small area, the same surface in a smaller volume. And that's why the convolutions of the brain the JRI and the sulci, all these, if we expand the brain, what is the total surface of the brain expanded? I don't know, but it's uh, quite a few cubic uh, or go away. Um, not cubic, but uh, square meters. Um, total brain surface. Area, okay. Surface areas. Centimeters centimeter squares, but okay, let's put it in feet. <laughs> so it's a scale that we like can. Yeah, two and a half, two and a half, almost three feet. Okay. So think of a paper two by three feet. Three feet is one meter. That's three feet, folks. Okay, and then to go two feet up or vice versa, two feet up and three, whatever. Two and a half by two and a half feet. That's the surface of the brain, okay? That's the surface of the cerebral cortex, which is most great, much greater than the size of our brain just by, if it were just a sphere, a simple sphere inside the head, inside the skull, there will be much less surface, right? Okay. But it's not just a sphere. It's convoluted in and out, in and out, in and out, just like the inner membrane of the mitochondria to increase surface area for uh, recharging ATPs. There's a mitochondria. All right. So anyway, a brain has a lot of surface for doing all the thinking process and the feeling and the emotion and, and all that. Hmm? But they occur in different parts of the brain, in different parts of the gray matter, because also there's specialization and there's regionalization, right? And so, for example, the writing center is on one side and the hearing is on the other side. And the thought process, especially abstract thought, the fact that I'm able to articulate something intelligible and you're able to understand and process that intelligibility. Uh, where does that occur regionally, specifically within the brain, within the whole brain? <laughs> The fact that you can understand what I'm saying, that I can actually articulate something that's intelligible. Where is that happening organically? We know that it's on the cortex, but where regionally, in what part of the brain? The frontal lobe, exactly. That's why this is, they say stubborn, thick-headed. This is thick-headed. This is the thickest part of our skull here, even though uh, it's, um, it's not really that thick, but it's very dense, it's very dense. And then it has membranes also to protect it and cushion it, but the frontal lobe, is uh, the core of the action. Where is my PowerPoint? Yes, okay. So, um, and you see, it's uh, mostly the, uh, where's this orientation? Yeah, here's the frontal lobe, it's, it's on the right, okay? This is the frontal lobe. And that's what gets developed most, hmm? which is on the top here, okay? Now, this is what happens. See, frontal lobe, frontal gray matter. 
it's peaking around 11 to 13 years of age, more or less, or nine to 13, early adolescence. So that peaks, meaning that synapses are the connections between neurons and the thought process has to go through a network of synapses, all right? And again, it's lightning speed, how all this is transmitted and that one way or another generates thoughts and also feelings and sentiments. But at first, there's a very fast growth like gangbusters of those synaptic networks. And we end up with too many synaptic networks, too many. And so synaptic pruning has to occur. Some of those networks have to be cut down because it's too many. Now, I was trying to think of an analogy, uh, which would be this. Let's say when the city of Miami was just beginning to be built, go back a century ago, they were really just dirt roads. And I've really, I've seen, there's a restaurant down in the South called Shorty's Barbecue. Shorty's Barbecue Pit. Yeah, the thing burned down it used to be uh, wood and it burned down. We don't know if it was burned down for the insurance, but it burned down and they rebuilt it. But anyway, at Shorty's, they had pictures. I know they still have them, black and white, of course, of US-1 and Sunset Drive, dirt roads, dirt road, okay? If you can picture US-1 today, it's a six lane road. Three lanes on one side, three lanes on the other side with a median in between, but those were dirt roads about 100 years ago. So all of the streets in Miami 100 years ago were dirt roads. And that's why the flooding was a big issue and the real estate and all that, because when you get the thunderstorms, you got mud all over the place. Now, eventually those roads started to be paved, and there were many pathways, trails that were going all over the place, all right? But no one trail went straight directly. They were, they meandered around. That happens, for example, with cattle, when you take out cattle to graze, because I lived in Boston for a while. Boston is a hilly city, and the roads there are all meandering. There's seldom do you find a road in, in Boston that is just straight through, okay? That would be a more recent road that was built artificially. But the older roads in Boston, they go, they meander all over the place because they were supposedly where they're originally the paths of the cow pastures, of the cattle. And they took the cattle out when that, all that was rural and the cows would meander here and there and they would generate a path, but it was not a straight path, okay? They kind of followed the gradient. So there are too many of these pathways. And if I'm trying to get from point A to point B, Physically, the shortest distance is a straight line, but topographically, it may involve hills or mountains or whatever, or a river in between. And so there are these sideway pathways, okay? That's kind of what happens when the brain is growing, the, the cerebral cortex is growing so fast that it's making a lot of connections. And that's also why in these years, the young people don't necessarily make the right decisions. They don't have a full brain, literally. They don't really have a full brain, functionally, right? Maybe by size, around years, I don't know, say eight or 10, more or less, the, the size of the brain is, uh, or the skull is about the size of the adult, right? But internally, the brain or, or at the cortex level, the connections have not been consolidated. So what happens, little by little, the brain does this, and it does this mostly with stimulation of learning, all right? And especially abstract thought. What happens is there are too many alternative pathways for the thought to take place, right? To be uh, functional, to be energetically economic, and to be the right type of uh, thought process, especially think of a mathematical, uh, a derivation that we do in an algebra or something like that, all right? Um, factoring an equation or whatever, it takes abstract thought. And so the brain, what it does is it starts 
cutting off synapses. It starts dumping synapses that are lateral pathways that are not as direct highway that is needed. And so little by little, the synaptic pruning essentially is like building highways, right? You can go from the Golden Gate Interchange on uh, the Palmetto and go horizontally, make the loop around Miami Lakes and then down at Dadeland in the south with no traffic, ha ha ha, no traffic on the Palmetto, right? <laughs> it doesn't ever happen, maybe two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, but you can do that maybe in 20 minutes. Sometimes I hear them because I live nearby here and what I hear, those motorcycles, they're having the races two or three in the morning, they go, Whoo! you hear the, the high, they're racing from the Golden Glade Interchange down to Dayland and back, right? Yeah, those are the organ donors, live organ donors. Anyway, uh, that highway, if I were to do that through Lejeune or something like that, it would take me an hour and a half <laughs> going through the lateral streets because they're not as direct passage. I imagine one would be even more direct, which would be a straight line, not an inverted L that is a palmetto, but it's just draw a straight highway from the Golden Glade Interchange diagonally on top of the city of Miami all the way down to Dayland, for example. That'd be sweet, right? That is most direct pathway. That would be like a super highway. And that's the synaptic pruning. The lateral streets are cut down, cut off, as you can see. And so synapses are lost, connections between neurons are lost in order to consolidate certain pathways. I would have preferred to see here more density of synapses. It would be almost like this one here where you see more density, all right? It would have been more illustrative, more informative if this third photo or shot, whatever it is, would have more density, but in just like channels, particular areas, because that's exactly what happens. That's synaptic pruning. And that continues until, and that finalizes, I'm surprised they don't have a 20 year old brain here shown, you know, it would be more, even more informative because we'd see major trunks of synapses with kind of empty space in between, all right? And that's where the thought process would go, especially higher higher thought, abstract thinking, okay? And that's illustrated here with this colorized, uh, it's probably CT, a computer uh, uh, tomography of the cortex, right? Which uh, colorized to show more density at the frontal lobe, the most density. All right, so what happens is, this finalizes, this process finalizes between 20 and 25 years of age, as you can see here, okay? So we actually lose synapses <laughs> and makes us more mature. And so I never say this to teenagers, but between us, when a teenager makes a mistake, in part is because they didn't have a full brain. <laughs> so they have an excuse, <laughs> I think I have a full brain when I crash. <laughs> okay, but it's true. There's an organic basis to the thought process and that existentially, that's why we see teenagers all over the place. They can't really decide, you know, they, they, they may wanna do what's right, but they end up not doing what's right because they're still struggling with all these various pathways, various alternative thoughts that come into mind. And they don't always think very clearly and very succinctly and therefore, as I say, youth and wisdom not necessarily match, right? Don't necessarily match because in part it's because of this. The organic substratum of the brain is not mature enough yet. So it takes about two dozen years for the brain to mature. And then that's why this is a gradual process, okay? A gradual shift. But uh, what I wanna say by all this, after an hour and a half of this thing, is that um, this is where we wanna land up. We wanna, we wanna land eventually as responsible mature adults, self-motivated and other-centered, okay? Other-centered. So when I get up in the morning, I look forward to the day and the problems of the day and the challenges of the day so that hopefully we may help others make it through the day, okay? Questions, comments?
Hopefully this begins to fit in to the bioethical issues at the beginning of human life, because it's not easy for an, un an unplanned pregnancy to do the right thing, which is to take that baby to term and either keep him or her or give him or her for adoption. It's more challenging actually for young pregnant women to give that child up for adoption than to struggle raising the baby as a single mom or something like that. When you think about it, again, it's essentially why? Because the bonding has already occurred. After the second or third month, after the patadita, the little kick, she starts bonding with that child. You know, So after carrying the pregnancy for nine months, how am I gonna give this child up? They feel like they're, they're throwing away their baby, you know? But they're not throwing away their baby, they're throwing away their baby to a couple who is unable to have children and desperately want to have children and have all the means necessary to give that kid the best love and education that they can. So you can see that it takes a lot of maturity to give a child up for adoption, right? But basically what does it do? It saves the life of the child <laughs> and it saves the conscience of that mom. Joe. If you were to go back a slide here to three. Yep. To be self-motivated and other-centered. And can you kind of extrapolate like uh, heaven, hell, Jesus forgiving sins into like a biological perspective on yeah. the purpose of life? Thank you. That's why we talk about the unitary vision of the human person in contrast with some oriental philosophies and theologies like Buddhism and Hinduism and Shintoism and so forth that have a dualistic view of the human person, kind of a radical separation between body and soul. And of course, then which one ends up being the good and which one ends up being the bad? Well, the good is the soul and the bad is the body because the body is subject to all these passions, right? But that's not what we call a, 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 a good anthropology, a theological anthropology of the human person. We espouse a unitary vision of the human person, as John Paul II said a lot, body and soul one, body and soul one. So it's not just uh, my body, but it's also my soul, my, my spirit, my conscience. And if I talk about conscience, then I have an in, I segue into ethical conscience, right? Now, what do we say about Jesus Christ? He is the human. He is the man, the human. He is the one who shows us. And can you think of anyone, any other human that we can think of that was more self-motivated and other-centered than Jesus Christ? I mean, I think of two examples who have been in our lifetime that we have had the privilege to know or know of, and actually got to meet them both once, uh, is uh, John Paul II and Mother Teresa. You know, who doesn't know John Paul II and Mother Teresa? When he went to parts of the world uh, that were non-Christian, non-Catholic, people flocked to him or her, right? The, the Daughters of Charity, we have Daughters of Charity here in Miami, we have the dubious honor of having the Daughters of Charity, the religious order that Mother Teresa founded. Why? Because we have a lot of homeless, right? They work with the homeless, okay? You don't find the Daughters of Charity in well-to-do places. They don't live in Pinecrest. <laughs> they live downtown Miami in inner city, <laughs> okay? Uh, so it's that self-giving. And these two people, these guy and gal of John Paul II and Mother Teresa have inspired literally millions of people to try to do good, right? And there's sacrifice involved. Yeah, but the sacrifice is redemptive. The sacrifice gives meaning to my life. So I no longer look after uh, pleasure. Now I look after happiness. <laughs> hmm? And that's the shift, but it's a gradual shift. And that's why we say Jesus is, illumines uh, our humanity because he shows us the, the way. In fact, he told us, I am the way, the truth and the life, right? Uh, but it takes a while to get into that. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once it's a little addictive, because when we get into that mode, uh, we start liking it. Uh, we get more and more. And what happens? Eventually, we end up with the discernment of a vocation. 
And uh, in contrast to profession, which are hundreds of profession, not a little SDU, okay, with all due respect, but you go to MDC, you go to FIU and you open up the catalog of, of uh, careers of vocation, I have hundreds, literally hundreds of careers of vocations, of professions, right? And even some of them are called a vocation, oh yes, the medical profession is a vocation, the nursing is a vocation, education is a vocation. In colloquial terms, yes, but canonically speaking, no. There are only two vocations in life, two vocations, which is the married life or the religious consecrated life, priests and nuns, okay? Those are vocations because they are calling. So we get into that calling from God. I'm gonna bring in calling help. Believe me, I'm gonna get into NFP and I'm gonna get into cloning and some sort of research, but <laughs> still trying to put in the foundation because this kind of foundation cannot be thin, you know, cannot be paper thin. We're talking about a real rock solid foundation that is not seen on the building, but we're not building a one story house. We're building the humongous building on top of this, okay? A skyscraper, which is ethical behavior, principle. And therefore that foundation has to be very solid. And the foundation is, precisely the understanding of a deep, deep theological anthropology. That's what we're doing, a theological anthropology. In other words, a view of the human person, anthropology, that is illumined, that is inspired by God, incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? So the madness of madness. How do we explain that God becomes a human being? That is a scandal for the Jews and an absurdity for the Greeks, as scripture says, right? How can God become a human being? Because God is the most crazy of all crazies. He's the maddest of all the mad. And the madness is madly in love with us. You think we're stubborn? He is infinitely more stubborn than us. And he will not, he will be relentless to save all humanity to the point of giving us his son and doing with his son what we decided to do, which there is the crucifix. So there's this passion, right? The passion, the passion of Christ. He gave his life passionately for us because of the madness of love that he has for us. Why? Because he has, he's very much aware of what hell is. And he certainly doesn't want anyone else in there. For all eternity, okay, let's get, get back to the stove. I know that now we have electrical stove, but Gas is the best, right? Cooking with gas is the best. Okay, now we have the stove on. Your choice, electric or gas. Get close to that stove. Have you ever been just cinched a little bit by fire? Have you ever been cinched a little bit by fire? Is that painful? That is really painful. Now imagine the whole body in fire without dying, but just cinching, cringing in fire, unquenchable fire, for all eternity, it's, I mean, just to think about that for a moment makes me wanna, it, 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 it disintegrates me. How can anyone possibly end up in hell and want to be there, you know, for whatever pleasure of a thousand years here on earth, which we're only behind a thousand years. Let's say a hundred years is a long time. You say, I have a hundred years of illegitimate pleasures, you know, of uh, unethical uh, pleasures for an eternity of hell? Where's the balance? It's insane. If, if, if anyone starts reflecting a little bit of what hell is, we would all be super good people. <laughs> we would all be super behaved. <laughs> Talk about other motivated, <laughs> okay? And the alternative is just pure heaven and bliss. Any pleasure that you can think of. Okay, I think of ice cream. I have a difficulty deciding between my two favorite ice creams, either um, coconut or dulce de leche. I don't know if you've ever had dulce de leche, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but was, those are my two favorite ice creams. Uh, and I eat the ice cream, two scoops with a sugar cone and all that, five, 10, 20 minutes, I can stretch it out to half an hour eating the ice cream very slowly. But then afterwards, sooner or later, I have to brush my teeth and the pleasure is gone, over. And I can only think about what it used to be, but that doesn't give me any pleasure to think of what that was when I was licking it, all right? And so it's temporary. 
happiness is very different. Happiness for a priest is getting a call from the hospital at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go anoint someone who is dying. All right. And so we anoint the person, total stranger. And then um, the next day, we get the call from a family member thanking us profusely that we were able to give the anointing of the sick, which forgives the, the sins of that patient who was in coma. Forgive the, pay, the sins of the patient who was in coma and then died a few minutes or a few hours later in a state of grace. So can you imagine the happiness that it brings to my heart that I was able to restore a person to a state of grace just before they were dying? And, and I remember that. And I remember all the anointings that I've done to people in hospitals <laughs> you know, throughout decades of, of uh, being a priest. That's happiness. And every time I think of that, that brings joy to my heart, unlike the, the coconut ice cream. So to put it in context, right? What we're talking about here, yes, it's a type of love that I understand is not too popular and it's sacrificial love. It's what our parents did to raise us, et cetera, et cetera. But all these issues at the beginning of life and at the end of life are gonna have to do one way or another with sacrificial love, you know, which is the best expression as far as we can tell from experience, from our own lives, that this is really the way to go. But it is a gradual process. And it takes a lifetime, <laughs> okay? So we're all in process, at different stages of life, and life teaches us. If my parents hadn't had an accident when I was in my late 20s, where I had to take care of my parents for a year and a half, everything, I probably wouldn't have been a priest. <laughs> I'd probably still be scuba diving in the morning and sailing in the afternoon and partying at night, because that was the plan. <laughs> it's almost like difficulty like a lot of difficulties almost get you to that point. Yes, yes. You know? It builds character. And that's why I tell young couples today, especially los cubanitos, you know, the Hispanics, don't bubble your child. Don't bubble your child. Burst that child. Burst that bubble. Because if you bubble your child, what you're raising is a selfish human being that is only going to care about self-centered and other motivated into their adulthood. Kenny. <laughs> the bubble is the protection. Uh, I have a dear friend of mine, and um, they uh, they got divorced, and she ended up raising the child, and the child is an only child, and she protected that kid, you know, from the harsh experience of what uh, dad had done, which was abandon the mama in in a moment of uh, tragedy, just abandon her, okay. And she protected that child, overly protected. They call them helicopter moms, helicopter parents. You send your kid to Florida State or wherever they're going, to Gainesville. But psychologically, they're still over there, helicoptering over the kid so that the kid doesn't make any mistakes or doesn't get involved with any drugs or anything. And you got to burst that bubble because the experiences of making mistakes, I'm not... Okay, I'm not advocating for sin, right? I'm not, I'm not advocating for Don't sin. Don't coddle. Don't coddle. You know, like yes. sometimes they have to suffer consequences. They do. You had the accident. I'm very sorry for you, but you're paying for that car repair. Thank the Lord that you're still alive and you're paying for that car repair. Now, I'll give you a loan without interest, but you're going to pay me $10 every week until you get to the $2,000 of that car repair. <laughs> See? It teaches building character, building, I don't know any other way than hardship to build character. Because the problem is, you kind of got to think you're not always going to be there for the kid, right? Like anything, how many children lose their parents? Exactly. If you take it, if you call them so much that you don't let them fend for themselves, right. and the day you're not around, they have right. And even simple things. I mean, I'm so grateful. I don't want to thank the Castro brothers for losing my country of Cuba. But my brother and I were like seven, eight years old when we got out of Cuba. My parents were young. My dad was Italian. He was a diplomat in uh, the Italian embassy. My mom, like I said, was an architect. So we were all set. We lived by the, by the beach. We had the life of Raleigh. And all of a sudden, we left out with one suitcase each. 
1960, my parents barely knew some English and they started a new life and they made a decision. My parents made a decision at that point, consciously to say, okay, you man go out to work all day. And I woman stay with the kids and will raise these kids. My mom was a professional. Conceivably, she could have made even more money than my father as an architect here in, in the US. But she decided she was gonna raise us too, but it, because it took her full time to raise us, you know, and my dad went to work. And he started at a basement in New York City at uh, Alitalia on, uh, on the building. The Alitalia was an Italian airline company. And he worked his way up from being a, a clerk in the basement all the way into management. And then he was sent as a manager to Mexico and we kept progressing on and on. So they rebuilt their life, you know, and we left with nothing. Uh, but what, to my point, what they taught us when we were kids, they taught us how to cook, how to iron. I iron my shirts. <laughs> when I wash them, I iron my shirts. You know, I know how to, cut. I went shopping, I do my food. I, I, I can manage an account, you know. Today, people get change. And what, well, how much is this change? They, they have to plug it into their phone to make a, a simple addition or subtraction. Let's not talk about a multiplication <laughs> or division, right? Where are we going? This is the youth of today is the leaders of tomorrow. They'll be the senators and the presidents of tomorrow of the largest, of the most powerful nation in the world with an access to the button to nuclear warfare, okay? And so we need to take charge of what's happening in the education system. When, when the students come in here from our high schools, we have to retool them, we have to redo high school for them. I'm talking generalities, of course, okay? But you know your peers and you know what's around. And these are the challenges. But they say in the business world, the building next door, the challenge is the opportunity. The challenge is the opportunity. And that's why I hope you chose bioethics to not everybody chooses. It's a small program. There are programs in here, master's programs that have dozens, even hundreds of students, you know. But this is the thinking process. So I guess abstracting further how you have America, you have China. And in America, you have the eagle, and in China, I think it's the dragon, something like that, right? And you have these ideologies, right? And you see in China more of an invasive uh, type of control of their people, okay? So I guess what type of of values, I guess it's a lot like the government's controlling the specific yeah. people's actions, every single action they take yeah. as we go further into this big data type of world and the aggregation. Yeah. If okay. I may, just to give an example, photo recognition, facial recognition, they have cameras in China from what I hear, there are cameras all over the place in the cities and they're constantly, constantly, their database is humongous, a photo recognition of all their citizens because they really need permits. They, they cannot, they're not free to get into a car and go to another city, another town. Some are, but not, not all people. There, there's a lot of population control, of social control, right? And I, I'm thinking that the government is also, it's almost like schizophrenic. They, they don't, they can't let go into freedom, what we call the open societies of the West, the open societies of mostly North America and in Europe, but a little bit other places too. But these open societies, an open society is very fragile, very delicate, right? Because in an open society, terrorists can do chaos. Terrorists can actually fly airplanes into buildings in an open society. That's the extent of fragility of the democracy. So pardon the interruption, but back to the totalitarian system of controlling the population, right? And so with all due respect, the anthropology is defective. I mean, not that we have, but I've lived in many countries of the world and uh, this is not perfect, but I don't see Americans 
jumping into the ocean and swimming into Cuba or into Nicaragua or into uh, other places of the world or, or go to China, right? It's always the other way around. So we have something that we need to cherish here and protect very much, which is a democratic thing, civil discourse. And we know we're gearing up to the primaries and then we're gearing up to the general <laughs> presidential elections in 24. It's a lot at stake because there's allergy all over the place, you know? But yes, the anthropology. And again, it's kind of dualistic to give other little examples. The Chinese, Again, with all due respect, I'm talking facts. They copy everything. We make the machine, they buy it, they take it apart, and they reproduce it. And they make massive computers, exactly, one-tenth the price. Why? Because we did all the research, we did all the R&D, and et cetera, right? And produced the product, and now they copy it. And they have absolutely no qualms about copyright or intellectual property or anything. It just doesn't exist. It's the collective. So they justify because this is for the collective of the people. Of course, they have to feed also a quarter of the of the population of the world, you know, which is a lot of people. But uh, you see, the anthropology is dualistic. Is dualistic. The Christian population of China is maybe between one or two percent, and that includes also uh, Protestants who have made quite a bit of inroad, but it's very tiny. It's mostly ancestor worship. It's not, it's and polytheistic. Like, you would just say illegal for them to be Christians and be celebrated. Yes, it, it's persecuted. It's, not it's persecuted Christian. to the point that there is actually talk about the Catholic Church. There is a national Chinese Catholic Church that is controlled by the government. It's controlled by the the one party system, right? right. To the point that they appoint bishops. <laughs> so that's not even. And Pope Francis is trying to negotiate. I know that the Pope is controversial. He's trying to negotiate with the party, the Chinese party, so that they can come to some kind of an agreement. And... How can you come to an agreement in banking truth? Exactly. Right? So you have the government telling the Catholic Church what to do with regards to Catholicity. And of course, it's all very predictable. The, the bishops or the priests that the Chinese uh, system is going to choose the party, the Chinese party is going to choose as bishops are all priests that are with the ideology of the party. They're going to hold the party line, right? And therefore, they're going to put the party line ideology above Christianity and above Catholicism, which is not a good thing. And so there is also an underground Chinese Catholic Church, which is being persecuted. And we have even bishops who are in pectory. They are bishops in pectory within their heart, within their chest, because many people don't know they're bishops. But we need some of those bishops to ordain priests and to keep the thing going and to ordain other bishops to keep the underground Chinese Catholic Church going. And what Pope Francis is trying to do is to merge those two churches to have one holy Catholic and apostolic church in, uh, in China. But uh, some attempts were attempted. It didn't work because invariably uh, it, it doesn't work on their side. You know, there's a uh, anecdote of a uh, of a visitor who goes to this young person, this young man was thinking about becoming a monk, so he goes into a monastery to for a visit, and the abbot is taking this young man around the monastery. And they come to the grounds uh, outside and the fields, and there's a little stream there, and there's a branch hanging over the stream, and there's a scorpion on the branch that is about to fall into the stream. And there's this other monk on the coast, on the, on the shore, trying to save the scorpion, okay? So the monk reaches out to the scorpion, and the scorpion stings the monk, and he pulls back, and then he goes back again, to try to save the scorpion from falling into the stream. And the scorpion stinks him again and goes back and forth like that. And the, and the young man says, Abbot, why is this monk doing this? Doesn't he see that the scorpion is stinging him? Uh, he says, yes, it's the nature of the scorpion to sting, but it's the, nation, it's the nature of the monk to try to save the life of the scorpion. <laughs> you see? So uh, 
how do you deal when you have such disparity in the dialogue, right? When the Pope is reaching out, the Pope has reached out to, I think I mentioned this, to Patriarch Kirill. You know who Kirill is? Patriarch Kirill is Cyril in Cyrillic language, which is the language of Russia and the Ukraine. And uh, Patriarch Kirill is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, <laughs> which to this day is officially associated with the Russian government. In other words, Vladimir Putin, right? In fact, recently, again, not a week goes by, just last week I saw in the news, maybe it was this week in the BBC that I look at, Vladimir Putin has uh, put in public display his icons Russian Orthodox icons. And one of them is the Rublev icon, which I love. It's the Trinity. Yeah. I didn't know who had this icon, but this is an old, um, yeah, of course, that's a copy. <laughs> but the original was made by this Mm, artist, I can have artist uh, called Rublov, and this represents the Blessed Trinity at the Last Supper. Now, you see that the three faces are the same. That's the prosopon, okay? So three persons in one nature. Who is the sun? The sun is the most evident. The sun is to the right. They all have this little reed, which is a symbol of authority, is a cane, all right? That this represents the divinity, the little cane. Who's blessing the meal? The sun. See the sun blessing the meal? I'm sorry, I can't. No? I mean, Doesn't... I don't know what I'm looking at with the canes. The little cane, you see the little cane? Yes. That they're holding? Okay. Right. But where are the, other the, the little reed, I... the little reed is here. Okay. Look at three vertical oh. uprights, and the okay. little reed is here. So they all have They all have it, and they all have it in their hand. Okay. Okay. And it's, uh... yeah, it's all left hand also. They all have it because they, for Signarse, they, they make the sign of the cross with the left hand and with in the opposite direction. This is Eastern Catholics, Orthodox or not Catholic, actually, Orthodox. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> the reed is, represents the authority, so that's their divinity. The three faces are the same. They're looking at each other. They're in communion. And there's the Eucharist. And the sun is blessing the meal. And the sun is also caped in Marian blue. So the womb, this cape represents the womb of Mary. Okay. Uh, they have wings because they're pure spirits, even though they're not angels. And then the colors make a difference. So if this is gold, who is he? Well, the, all three are God, one God, oh, the, Father. the Father. God the Father. And green is for hope. Which is the Holy Spirit. In the middle. And then the sun to the right, because you say you see that the right hand is the father. Yeah. That's but, kind of my thinking. But uh, I know, but it's a triangle. Okay. okay. So who's okay. to the right and to the left of whom? <laughs> okay. It's a triangle. Okay. All right. So the middle is kind of a Western. And you're analyzing it with Western concepts of balance and symmetry. Okay. All right. But Eastern is different. The symmetry of this is very different. So, for example, the point of perspective, uh, Punto de Fuga, what do you call the vanishing point, which you can tell just barely from this one, from this little structure up here, the vanishing point is going that way, right? But the vanishing point of this little chair is going in the opposite direction. <laughs> so you actually have two vanishing points, which is not, you know, in normal life, look at a train track, those to one vanishing point. Punto de fuga, el punto de fuga. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. So there's uh, this is iconography. It's a theology in painting instead of words. Hmm? 
Anyway, so uh, I found out just recently that Putin is the one who owns this, uh, apparently. He's exposing his, uh, his iconography. In other words, he's trying to say, I'm a very religious person. I'm a very devout person. And Petra Kirill is proposing Vladimir Putin for beatification, what? for sainthood, for sainthood. All right? Now, I've heard that Pope Francis has made at least two direct approaches to meet with Petra Kirill. And the patriarch has said, no, thank you. We always have a problem when the church associates with officially with the government. We always have a problem. So these are the issues of our time, <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh, natural family planning is the alternative to contraception and in vitro fertilization. And it is, as the word says, a natural means, okay? Natural means. Now, natural family planning, when uh, lived properly, when lived properly, can be as effective as contraception, for example, which is 98 to 99% effective when it's used for avoiding children. Now, natural family planning can be used either for avoiding children or for increasing the probability of having children for couples who cannot conceive naturally, okay? Or who are having difficulty conceiving. There's a lot involved here, but I'm going to tap back into the unitary vision of the human person, body, mind, and soul. In other words, physically, psychologically, and spiritually. We have to think of a unit. We separate them for the purpose of study, but in reality, they occur one, you know, because I am myself, body, mind, and soul, one person, and so is every other human, okay? So there are 10 symptoms that can tell a woman when she's ovulating with a very high probability, like I say, 98 to 9% accuracy. And those are the ovulation symptoms that we're gonna look at. And then after we do the biology, as we do in this two-step uh, business, is we do the bioethical analysis of NFP, All right? I don't know why that's blank. So let's dive right in. The symptoms of ovulation. Remember that what is the window of fertility opportunity on the part of the woman? So the point of ovulation? Yes. So the egg lived like 48 to 72 hours? Is that what you're talking More about? like 24. To, really? to 48, one day. Oh, it's the sperm then that lasts longer. Up to five days. Right. Okay. In the female tract, because by itself, also 24 hours. Yeah. By itself. Within its residence of uh, the testicles and the seminiferous ve uh, uh, vesicles and all that. Again, sperm is 24 hours, egg is 24 hours. They're delicate, they're really right. delicate cells. All right. And so that's the normal lifespan. Uh, but of course, the one that counts is the egg because that's in resident inside deep within the female reproductive tract over there at the ampulla, right? The, the bedic, uh, what is known as the horn of the, of the, uh, of the uh, fallopian tube. So the window is about 24 hours in the narrow sense. If there is no fertile egg, if there's no mature egg at the ampulla or anywhere within the female tract, if there's no mature egg there, How many millions of sperm can we have without fertilization? Or is there fertilization? Let me rephrase. If there is no mature egg to be fertilized, can fertilization occur? No, oh, no egg, no fertilization, right? As simple as that. Recently, I saw in the newspaper that, uh, in the news again, <laughs> the BBC, they should pay me for all this advertising, that a crocodile had a, uh, gave, uh, had a, uh, developed a, a, an egg, a, a, an embryo, uh, parthenogenically. And how did they deduce that? Well, this was a female alligator, it's actually a female crocodile, 
that was in, um, I think it's in Great Britain, Great Britain somewhere, some kind of a zoo. And it was a female crocodile. And for decades, this female crocodile has been in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> not celibate, no male crocodile around to fertilize her. And all of a sudden she laid an egg that had a stillborn baby crocodile inside. Didn't survive, but how did that thing come about? It's not that at night in the middle of the night, a male crocodile flew over the sky and landed into her fertilizer and then went back to his own cage. Just didn't happen. This crocodile uh, went through parthenogenesis, which we covered in other uh, species, but it happens in reptiles. It happens, we know it in lizards, we know it in uh, snakes, we know it in some fish. Apparently it had never been documented in crocodiles. And uh, really when the herpetologists were consulted, herpetology, the ones who study uh, reptiles, they were not that surprised the, because they were really never looking for it in crocodiles or alligators. <laughs> uh, but now it's documented, so now you can bet your dollar that uh, some herpetologists are going to be looking for parthenogenesis in uh, alligators and crocodiles, right? All right, so back to the um, ovulation. The ovulation is the key moment, not menstruation. Oh, yes. So NFP is not, 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 not the rhythm method. Okay, because the rhythm method is based on menstruation. And menstruation is a post facto, it's an after the fact event. It's like when do we throw out the garbage? It doesn't matter when we throw out the garbage. The main event was the dinner. You know, I can throw out the garbage or even wash the dishes right after the dinner, or I can wash them two days later, right? The event was the dinner. In other words, the event is the ovulation itself. And these are 10 symptoms that are specific to when ovulation occurs in the woman. Three are primary and seven are secondary. So we give priority to the primary because the three primary are directly related to the ovulation process. And the other seven are secondary. They're kind of side effects of the actual ovulation process. This is all physiology. This is all the woman metabolism of maturing an egg of ovulation. So let's get into it. The three primary uh, symptoms is the basal body temperature, the activity of the cervix, and the cervical mucus. Basal body temperature is also known as the BBT, right? It's the temperature at rest. When we wake up in the morning, and even before we wake up in the morning, when we are at rest, what is our temperature, our body temperature? Which is normally what? Fahrenheit, 98.6, centigrades, the incubator in the in, the in vitro clinic, 37 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's the, uh, the centigrade equivalent, 37. The lab experiments, you run it in body temperature, you have to keep it at 37 degrees. Okay, that's basal body temperature. Why? Because when we wake up and we start having the coffee and running around, what happens? Our body temperature starts fluctuating up and down, up and down, one, two, three degrees. If we're exercising, it can go up five degrees. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so we need it at the baseline, right? in rest. This is important if we we're going to use the thermometer for the woman to measure herself daily uh, before she actually gets out of bed. Then the activity of the cervix, which we'll look at, and the cervical mucus, which they're listed in priority. Of the three, the most accurate, most accurate is the actual mu the cervical mucus. All right, this is the most accurate of the three. So let's go forward. Oh, seven, the seven secondary, just to mention them. Mittel smirch, which uh, it comes from the German, which means middle pain. Mittel is middle. Schmerz is pain, all right? So the pain around the abdominal region, which is not the menstruation pain, is a different pain, is, is two weeks displays from menstruation. It's that ovulation. Mm -hmm. It's some pain that some women feel around the abdominal region, uh, but all of these symptoms have a range, vary from very mild to very severe. Most women are somewhere in between, and it also changes with time from very young to very old, you know, during the reproductive years, three to four decades. So all these symptoms have a range of intensity or lightness and also 
uh, within the year, the month and year of the woman herself, okay? So spotting, which again is not menstruation, this is spotting that may occur at ovulation itself, the, the rupture of the follicle, uh, little spots of blood that would appear on the underwear, okay? Swollen vagina and vulva, because then the reproductive, the external organs are preparing, they're swelling, there's accumulation of water or fluid basically, preparing for a potential intercourse. The libido also, the libido is just a psychological term for desire for sexual intercourse, all right? Which matches the hormonal level, increase in estrogen and so forth. Breast tenderness also, the, the breasts are preparing for the possibility of implantation or fertilization implantation, pregnancy nine months later, the breast better be ready for, for feeding the baby, right? General bloating, so the woman also retains, this is systemic, she retains water in general, right? Retains more fluid, more water. Again, just kind of preparing the body for a possible uh, pregnancy. And ferny, which is very interesting, this is uh, on the saliva, crystallization of estrogen on the saliva. <laughs> we'll get to that one. It's kind of uh, funny. All right, so the uh, these are some protocols that are out there that teach NFP. One can go online and they have a lot of documentation for free online in English or Spanish or any other languages. These are institutes that dedicate themselves into promoting natural family planning of the various uh, types. Different ones give more emphasis to one symptom or another, but most hover around the three main primary symptoms. The Creighton model is also known as NAPRO technology, uh, which is natural procreation. That's why I introduced the term procreation, right? Natural procreation, NAPRO technology. This one in particular focuses a lot on endometriosis. Endometriosis is a growth of tissue inside the, um, the, the womb, inside the endometrium of the woman, or sometimes in other places of the reproductive tract that can inhibit and can um, compete with uh, pregnancy. And so some women suffer from endometriosis at some point in their lives, in the reproductive years. And so it takes particular techniques to work with that to allow the woman to uh, restore her fertility, okay? This is obviously for women who want to uh, conceive. Mm, couple to couple league is another one that is worked precisely. The couples who learn NFP then become teachers of other couples who want to learn. Mm. Synto thermal method. This one focuses primarily on the first three. Thermal is a reference to the BBT. And symptom is the other two symptoms, the mucus and the cervix, the activity of the cervix. Billings was Dr. Billings. That was his last name. And Dr. Billings did a lot of research on the mucus. So Billings method focuses exclusively on the mucus, on the cervical mucus, okay? And the quality, how the quality of the mucus changes biochemically from ovulation to non-ovulation. And then there's another one that I discovered that uh, I like a lot. It's called Family of the Americas. This was founded by the wife of a Guatemalan president, uh, the president of Guatemala. Guatemala is one of the six countries in Central America and it has one of the highest levels of poverty and illiteracy. I lived in Guatemala for a period of time in my teenage years. And uh, uh, this uh, president was a very pro-life president and his wife was also very pro-life and studied this uh, and dedicated a lot of funds of the government to promoting um, natural family planning for the population of Guatemala, many of whom don't even speak uh, Spanish. They speak Quiche or one of the Mayan languages and, uh, and other native languages. And so they needed mostly iconography with photos and pictures and, and little diagrams of, of uh, men and women you know, uh, she was able to develop a whole program to teach uh, poor folks who were illiterate how to do, how to plan their children, okay, naturally. And it's based mostly on billings. So again, the mucus method, because these people don't have money to buy a thermometer or anything like that. And it's now they have a, a an institute here in the United States and it's called Family of the Americas. They publish an actual manual 
it can be either bought physically or you can go online and, and just examine it uh, for free. Uh, it's in Spanish and in English, and it has all the charting also that is very important on a daily basis, month by month. Charting is very important because that's what gives the assurance, you know, month after month of the woman becoming familiar with her cycle is what it's about. So let's look a little bit at the biology of um, the cervical mucus and the activity. First, the activity of the cervix. So here's a diagram of the cervix. The cervix is a smooth muscle, it's a circular muscle, all right? It's uh, generally these circular muscles are called sphincters. They're smooth muscles and they open and close. And they're sphincter, they're smooth because they're not controlled by the central nervous system. So they have their, their, they're in the autonomic nervous system, just like the pillars that I spoke about between the esophagus and the stomach, all right? Now one that uh, do have, that is controlled by the nervous, by the central nervous system is the mouth. And that's a circular muscle, but it is wired with a network so we can open and close our mouth, our, our lips. Uh, but the anus is another uh, muscle that is a sphincter, that is a circular muscle, and it's controlled automatically by nature when it's supposed to uh, do its thing, all right? So the cervix is one of these muscles, and it opens and closes literally into the inside of the woman because on the outside is the tube that is the vagina that opens up to the outside, to the environment. Whereas from the cervix inward, we go into the uterus, into the womb, and then beyond that, into the fallopian tubes and so forth. So really the gateway is the cervix, all right? And uh, so that cervix has an activity that varies and changes between ovulation and not ovulation. When the woman is ovulating, that cervix will be high, as you can see here, and soft and somewhat open, somewhat open. We're talking about millimeters. When the woman is not ovulating, the cervix drops down, it's like a little cone, and it's firm, the word is firm, all right? And it's closed, tight, right? And on the inside, there's even a plug. This is a mucus plug on the inside. So when it's open and the woman is ovulating, the mucus flows through. Physiologically, again, think functionally, during intercourse, the head of the penis, and we're talking about adult people here, the head of the penis comes up to the cervix, but not beyond. And so an ejaculation will occur in this general region. When the cervix is, when the woman is infertile during her uh, time of infertility within the month, and that cervix is dropped down and is firm and is closed tight shut, the semen is unlikely to go through to fertilize, right? Or the sperm. And so the semen stays outside and does not fertilize. And even if some sperm, because we're talking microscopic uh, cells here with the flagellum to wiggle in through and try to penetrate the cervix, they find a plug inside the mucus, all right? So a combination of the activity of the cervix and the mucus uh, plug prevents fertilization from occurring because it prevents sperm from going into her reproductive tract, into the uterus and then up the fallopian tubes as we saw in that little video, right? In contrast to that, when the woman is ovulating, that cervix becomes soft, goes a little higher and uh, opens up slightly, okay? Therefore, uh, it's a pathway. Now it's a pathway for some semen and especially the sperm to go in. And the mucus also facilitates that passage of sperm into the uh, uterus and then to proceed up the fallopian tubes. Here are actual photographs, as you can see, open and closed. And in fact, in close, this is not to, because this one also looks a little displaced sideways. But the, when the cervix, imagine the level of detail. It's amazing. Nature is so perfect. Well, not perfect, but the best possible. <laughs> uh, when, when the cervix, uh, during her infertile time, 
the fur the service drops down. It's um is close shut tight like a little firm cone, but it also displaces off center, off center. Think about the consequences of that physiologically if the intercourse is occurring, so that it doesn't really line up with the head of the penis. Okay, so it misses the target. <laughs> The ejaculation will miss the target, even to that level of detail that it displaces sideways somewhat during the infertile time, of course. Whereas when it's fertile, in principle, this should be a little further to the center, all right? And you can see clearly that it's much more open and soft. All right, so the mucus matches that, all right? And the mucus will be, all right, so let's go to the mucus because this is really the most accurate of the three. And the mucus uh, does this. When it is, uh, when the woman is having her, her, uh, her ovulation, the mucus is um, like egg white, but before cooking, egg white before cooking. It's transparent, it is runny, stringy, all right, elastic, and it feels like, almost like water. She feels wet, I'm told. She feels wet internally, all right? And so all this can be detected with the finger, typically the middle finger, which is the longest one, and she has to do a self-exam. Of course, hygiene is very important here. So the first thing she has to do is wash her hands and then proceed with the self-exam. And typically she will use the middle finger to feel how, what is the activity of the cervix. If the cervix is feeling uh, firm and, and uh, closed up, or if the cervix is higher up and more soft, right, and wet. And she will pick up some of that mucus and then she will proceed to do this to see what is the quality of the mucus. If it's long and stringy like that and uh, can stretch maybe one or two inches apart, look at that, all right? Uh, then she's ovulating. In contrast, what happens when she's not ovulating, the mucus becomes what they call tacky. It becomes opaque and doesn't have much stretch at all. Now, this matches what is happening biochemically because biochemically, this mucus is a polymucosaccharide. It's a polysaccharide that is very complex, but they're long fibers, okay? Polysaccharides, remember the sugars, remember like think of cellulose, for example. It's not cellulose, but it's one of these uh, carbohydrates that is a long, long fiber, all right? Very stringy. At the molecular level, not the molecular, at the cellular level, at the scale of cellular level, what do we have? We have the sperm who is trying to reach all the way to the horn of the fallopian tube to fertilize that egg. So the sperm has to travel all its distance. If we put this distance in proportion to the microscopic sperm, it's like kilometers and kilometers that this guy has to travel to get to the, to the actual egg, all right? And so, uh, that race going on, what the mucus does, it facilitates, it becomes highways of the, of the, for the sperm to travel through these long fibers of polysaccharides, right? That are flowing down all the way from the fallopian tubes through the uterus out the cervix hmm? and lubricating and giving nutrition and making that highway for the sperm to wiggle through. That's during ovulation, of course, facilitating the passage. In contrast, there's a change in pH, in pH of the woman's reproductive tract. And what happens with the pH change, which is monitored by, by uh, hormones, that polysaccharide, instead of being long strings like that, now it starts to curl up and to make a wad and to make like fishing line. I think of fishing line when it gets all tangled up like that and bubbled. That's what happens to the mucus with a change in pH. And so that's what makes the plug, you see? And it, it all bunches up like that. And now what used to be a highway for the sperm is now a barrier. And this is down to the molecular and cellular level at that level of microscopy at that, uh, that scale. So the whole body, and this is in, coordination, the whole body is reacting 
to the hormone levels, especially the, the estrogen and progesterone, which are uh, the two main hormones that are uh, cycling, okay? And are maintaining this kind of rhythm, right? Or cycle in the woman, which is an average of 28 days because it's a lunar cycle, because it has to do somehow with the pull of the water from the moon. Don't ask me how, but that's, that's uh, because it's a 28 day cycle. In principle, uh, when it's very accurate, all right? So the mucus, as you can see, is by far the most accurate of all the 10 symptoms. And that's the one that uh, Billings studied in detail, and that's what uh, uh, his method promotes. The other two are uh, auxiliary and help. Of course, it's a question of training over a period of time. The woman has to check herself periodically. And over time, she becomes familiar with her symptoms. And that's why of the three primaries, the least reliable is going to be, which one? The least reliable. Oh, vasobody temperature? Exactly, vasobody temperature, because that only is gonna increase maybe half to one degree of temperature, the temperature rises, there's a little spike. You hear about the spike. The spike is just when she's about to ovulate, but that spike is half to one degree difference in Fahrenheit, you know? So it's not that detectable. And certainly if she doesn't take that temperature like at five o'clock in the morning every day for months and years to get that, that base, all right? She's not gonna detect it. She's gonna miss the spike because it's only a 24 hour spike of the temperature. Number one. Number two, if she has a low grade infection or something like that, that's also going to raise the temperature a little bit and it's going to fake. You know, it could be, uh, it's not reliable. So, and it takes a lot of discipline to set the alarm on at five o'clock in the morning every day, take your temperature and then set the thermometer down, uh, go back to sleep, whatever. Because these thermometers can measure up, up to centesimals, right? So they're very accurate digital thermometers. And then what the woman would do is, Later, when she wakes up in the day, she'll take the thermometer and register that on the chart, and she'll be ch charting her temperature, and there will be a spike there at some point. But it's the least one of the, uh, of the it's the least reliable one, is the, the BBT. But I put it for the sake of completion because it's directly, that spike is directly related to the event of ovulation. Okay, uh, the other seven. Secondary, I talked about it quite a bit already. Um, well, the last one, ferning, just for completion. Okay. So again, I mentioned in these, there's a range from very mild to nothing to severe. And it also changes with the different uh, age of the woman from menarche, which is the first ovulation, somewhere around 10 to 12 years of age, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a big variation there. Therefore, these are just to kind of reassure the woman if any of these are occurring while the other primary symptoms are also occurring definitely to reassure her that yes, ovulation is occurring, okay? So let me just mention Fernin briefly, but uh, very briefly, it happens that there's an increase in estrogen in general when the woman is ovulating, but it's systemic because the estrogen goes into the blood system and all over her body, including the salivary glands. And some of that estrogen actually passes into the saliva. And so with a non-invasive test, taking a little bit of the saliva and putting it on a slide, on a glass slide that is very clean with a little tiny lens with a little microscope. It looks actually looks like a little miniature telescope. One can see the crystallization pattern of the estrogen that looks a little bit like, like a fern, like the leaf of a fern, okay? And, uh, but it's not too accurate. <laughs> so <laughs> you see the pattern? I mean, this is super, super elegant and extreme. This has high dosage of estrogen that crystallize and forms a pattern, okay? And that's the estrogen crystallizing on saliva. And so, uh, for example, this is an example with four. Uh, there's no, no ferning here. There's definitely a ferning there, but these other three don't really have much. Maybe something here is hard to tell, 
Anyway, it has to do with these are all examples, definitely burning there, maybe here and here, nothing here for sure, the others iffy, but don't trust burning as a, as a primary uh, mm, symptom of ovulation, all right? Now the ferning kit is just a little tube that has a lens. <laughs> you see, so it's just a tube. And I guess, I guess it transmits now, it's on digitally, you can follow it on, on the, uh, okay. On the uh, phone, but basically, oh, okay. So now they made this. Oh, interesting! They made it digital, so you don't even have to look. I'm used to the old, the old school of looking literally through a little uh, lens into the ferning pattern. Ah, uh, this one. <laughs> See the? Uh, can I do it? No. This guy. Still small. It's a little tube that has lenses, and you can focus on the ferning pattern and see if it's uh, if it's ferning or not. Okay, but it's a reference to an actual fern, which is a plant which uh, lives in nature, and it's not this. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, fern the plant. <laughs> oh, because I misspelled it. I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. It has a kind of that pattern, all right? So that's why it's called ferning. All right. So that was a uh, trivia pursuit. Now, so the woman, the, the wife, it really is up to her. <laughs> well, she's taking the contraceptive or doing the in vitro or doing in vitro. It's always on the woman. But if she's doing NFP, it's also on the woman to know her time of ovulation, that window, that narrow window of 24 hours when the egg is mature for possible fertilization. But the one day is not sufficient because when she's ovulating, then the whole tract is full of uh, cervical mucus. And therefore that's nutrient for the sperm which can live in there up to five days. So then we need to expand the window of fertility to five days. Now, for the sake of convenience, since a week has seven days, let's say you put one day before the five and one day after the five, guess what? We end up with seven days, which is a week. So we can say that on average, with one day of safety on either side, a woman is fertile, one week out of the month on average, one week out of the four weeks, see? Just for the ease of the arithmetic. Uh, so it behooves the woman to know her time of ovulation, either for avoiding the children or for wanting to have the children because believe it or not, some couple have difficulty conceiving. And it's a very complex thing. It's a really one of the most complicated things on earth is human fertility. Right, <laughs> and some couples really struggle with this. Now, a lot of couples think about uh, NFP or the other methods for avoiding the children. And I already talked about for serious matters, how children may be avoided, but kind of the default is to have the children, right? It, again, the unitive and the procreative in principle should go together. It's life-giving and love-giving and so forth, and the generosity of life. Thank God that our parents were generous, etc. So uh, for the woman to know her time of ovulation is something fantastic that she can bring into the marriage. Into the marriage, right? So it's good, it behooves her to know all this before in her teen years to find out her ovulation. But it's a two-edged sword because if you teach NFP to teenagers, they may want to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a two edged sword, right? When do you give the teenager the keys to the car? <laughs> Synaptic pruning. <laughs> All right. Anyway, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing because they should, the women, the young women should have this knowledge, hopefully by the time they get into the marriage, right? So they can apply it. 
What about the guy? What about the husband? <laughs> well, the husband needs a lot of discipline because unlike the woman, right? The husband doesn't have a cycling, not in this sense. We don't cycle our um, gamete production and we don't cycle our libido. Essentially, by the time we start producing sperm, on average, around 10 to 12, we actually mature a little later than a woman. From that point forward, it's high libido all the time, essentially all the time. And any normal man who doesn't agree to that, in my opinion, is lying. <laughs> because any normal man who is producing semen has high testosterone and therefore has high libido on average all the time, which doesn't match the woman cycling with high and low libido on a monthly basis, right? And that's what I meant about the libido differential. So what's on the part of the man? He's not getting pregnant, but he's producing further sperm and he desires his wife all the time <laughs> on average, right? So there we go into the psychological and into the spiritual and the mature brain. Discipline, respect, communication, creativity, to go to the movies instead of going to bed or et cetera, you know, or to move out to the sofa, whatever it takes. <laughs> if the couple has justified in conscience that they should avoid children because they already have four, five or six, or he's going through medical school and she's going through architecture school <laughs> and uh, they need the time for their careers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but it has to be something uh, not to have a vacation and not to change the car every two or three years for the latest model, those are priorities have to be established, all right? And priorities uh, take a lot of thinking and praying and the couple working it out, the couple working it out. So where do we go from here? The husband has to have that generosity of life to be able to make that marriage work. Okay, here we're gonna go into the biological analysis. We have to justify it as an end and as a means. The end, the goal, as I said, in principle, is the generosity of life to, for the couple to want children, to desire children, okay? Um, but the means also have to be ethical. And this is an ethical mean when it's used properly because you know a couple can also use NFP. In fact, uh, when I've prepared marriage, uh, couples for marriage, uh, they tell me, well, Father, what's the difference? If I'm using it to avoid children anyway, why not contracept, right? It's much easier. I don't have to be worrying about the biology or the psychology of it. Uh, why not just contracept and pop the pill or whatever? Because NFP, and they're right, NFP can be used with a contraceptive mentality. In other words, to avoid the children, no matter what, even when the couple could and should have children, right? So what's the difference? The difference is at the level of the end or the goal. That obviously, if NFP is used in a contraceptive mentality to avoid children at all means, then it's the wrong use. It's the wrong use of NFP, right? And so we have to justify the ends of it, that there are legitimate reasons for avoiding children at a particular time in the marriage. But the means also, so this is at the level of the means because it is a natural process, because it's respectful of the human anatomy and physiology and psychology and spirituality, taking the couple, you know, as a human couple, as two persons who are uniting their lives, but continue to be two persons, two people that should have that respect for each other, then it's justified as a means because there's nothing artificial about it. It's a vital process. I think we all agree that uh, conceiving is a vital process, right? <laughs> okay, It's not like uh, having a cataract operation or something like that. It's a vital process. It involves the next generation. And so the means also need to be justified ethically. All right. Uh, the rest, it maintains the unitive and the procreative together in principle. All right. Repetition, I go into the marriage vows. Okay, so Humanae Vitae is the flagship document to this day on uh, human procreation from the Catholic perspective. And it talks about for well-grounded, changed the language a little bit recently, it used to be serious reasons. 
Anyway, what well, grander reasons for space in the birth, so on. This goes back to 1968, uh, the, the document, the encyclical of Pope uh, John uh, uh, Paul VI. Talked about the contraceptive mentality. Just moving forward, I wanted to, uh, oh, I didn't have the, oh, you know, I just realized I'm using an older set here. In a, in a newer set, I actually had the marriage vows at the end, which is the marriage vow is uh, mm, to love and honor you uh, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love and honor you all the days of my life. And uh, the couple has to say that to each other. And that's what makes the marriage. Actually, they are administering the marriage to each other. They're administering the sacrament to each other. Right? And it's the marriage vows which are said in less than one minute. And it commits their life for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love and honor you all the days of my life. It is said very fast. And it takes a lifetime to live that, right? But uh, so the marriage preparation is trying to get the couples to reflect a little bit of, about that or a lot before, before they actually make the commitment. Because once they have the made the commitment, you know, if it's sealed in the eyes of God, it's sealed for good until death does them, does them apart, okay? All right, said a lot. Uh, questions, comments? It's a lot here to digest, I'm sure. Uh, we haven't had a break. Uh, tell you what, I'm going to go forward. If you people need a break, take a break. But I'm going to keep going because I only have about half an hour. All right. <laughs> That's the noon call. All right, where did I put the other two? Because there were three sets of, uh, I hope I sent you the three. Did I send the three? Oh, yes. Okay. I think in vitro, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, cloning and stem cells are together, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let me find my own email. Where is it? Hopefully, it's in here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Stem cell. Okay. Uh, points. No. Okay. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit into stem cell research and uh, human mm -hmm. cloning. Oh, great. You see how stubborn, persistent? Mm. Will not let me. Amazing. Oh, I think I blew it. It trapped me. It trapped me. No, they trap me. I know. It trapped me. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The market economy. <laughs> it trapped me. Look at that. Half my day. Uh, yes. Yes. Where? Now I have to go through the whole thing. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> finally, finally, finally. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. Talk about double edged swords. So, stem cell research and human cloning. Mm, it's still issues at the beginning of human life. Okay. But we're going to go back into technology. So we just took a breather from technology in NFP and look at the natural system, uh, God's creation and how it's supposed to function and so forth. Mm. 
Oh, yes, one thing I wanted to say <laughs> before I leave that is that uh, uh, I've been mentioning a lot that the NFP gives us an accuracy when it's used correctly, right, which involves a lot of discipline and self-checking and so forth. The assurance of uh, the pill, which could be anywhere from 98 to 99 percent accuracy. But that's still considering most people would want to use it for avoiding children if they have justified the serious reasons, all right, for avoiding children. But how about for enhancing the, possi enhancing the possibility of having children? Because believe it or not, some couples do have difficulty in having children. Otherwise, we wouldn't have adoptions <laughs> in the United States and in the world, right? So it can also help for enhancing the possibility of fertilization. Precisely, what would the couple do in that case? Well, they will concentrate their intimacy, their sexual intimacy, precisely when she's ovulating, because no sense, uh, you know, wasting uh, sperm when she's not ovulating if they're seeking a child, if they're seeking to have a child, right? So they will concentrate their activity in principle. But this is why I say that really uh, human procreation is super, super complicated and involves body, mind, and soul, believe me. Just uh, listening to what I'm saying, because after almost 40 years of priesthood, I've heard a lot of couples. Plus, as you can tell, I have some mm, medical background. I know a lot of doctors, including OBGYNs, et cetera. And we talk about the, the experiences and um, the issues. And this is what I'm trying to say, that um, for a couple who is seeking to have children and they're having difficulty, there are many reasons from the very banal to the very serious, like for example, sperm incompetence, which is a typical one for men, right? The sperm may produce the 100 million sperm in an ejaculate, but the sperm don't have a tail. That sperm is going nowhere. Or the acrosome, which is the tip of the sperm, is damaged for the acrosome reaction. That sperm may get to the egg, but may not fertilize, cannot go through the cortical reaction and all that, all right? And so uh, there are a number of things that can happen at the physiological level, but also at the psychological level, all right? So, uh, and I, I gave you, okay, let me stay with the examples of a difficult example, sperm incompetence. Maybe uh, the husband only produces a few thousand sperms in every ejaculate. That's totally incompetence. That's not, that's not enough sperm, all right? So um, they would concentrate their intimacy during the time of ovulation. Uh, however, there's also psychological factors involved here. For example, who hasn't heard of a couple who could not have children and after years of trying, they either adopted or did in vitro, but now they have baby at home. So they forget about getting pregnant anymore because now finally they have their baby. Six months later, she's pregnant. What was the infertility? The infertility was up here. There was nothing wrong with the plumbing of his and hers. They were, in fact, they they gone to the uh, urologists, OBGYN, to all the experts, fertility experts, and there was nothing physically wrong. She had he had competence. She was ovulating, okay, hormonal levels fine, but they were just conceiving, not conceiving. Why were they not conceiving? Because they wanted the kid too much. They really wanted the kid too much, and that was preventing them from conceiving. It's weird, but it's true. And so we have to be careful here. I've heard both cases, both scenarios where fertility experts will counsel, uh, some experts will counsel the couple to concentrate their sexual intimacy during her time of ovulation to maximize the possibilities of fertilization. But other couples will say, relax, don't even think about it anymore, go on vacation, do something totally different, and don't even think about it anymore. And that's when they get pregnant, <laughs> okay? Uh, or she gets pregnant. Uh, because there are psychological factors here involved also. The other extreme that proves the same point is that the average fertility rate for the US is about 10 or 12% more or less. In other words, what does that 12% mean? It means of American women, women living in the United States who are in their reproductive years, 
let's stretch it from 10 years of age to 50 years of age, right? That's 40 years of, of reproductive um, possibility, which is really stretching the limits, okay? It's mostly like 20 to 40 or something like that. But anyway, let's say for 40 years of reproductive fertility in the United States of all the women here, all right? On average, 10 to 12% of them are pregnant. <laughs> That's the fertility uh, rate. And every country varies a little bit more or less according to the health standards of each country. And if the population is younger or older and all those demographics. But the fertility rate for the US approximately around 10 to 12%, um, at least a few years back when I looked, I did that little paper on in vitro fertilization. Of all the women in the United States, again, I say this very respectfully, obviously not all of them are, uh, undergo sexual violence or rape, okay? But of that subgroup that has been violated sexually, rape, victims of rape, okay, that become pregnant, who are in first, who are in their fertility years. So I know, from 10 to 50 years of age on the large wide margins who become sexually violated with intercourse, with, with ejaculation. Uh, less than one or 2% actually become pregnant. Now there's no reason why that subgroup would have such a low fertility rate in contrast with the general population of women who are in their fertile years. In other words, with contrast with the 10%. There's no explanation for that physiologically, because in principle, this rape is occurring at random, let's say, on the fertility women in the United States, okay? Or, or the women who are in fertile years. It's not like the men are selecting the rapists, you know, is selecting beforehand. And so there's in principle, there's no statistical reason for why those two statistics should be so different and they are statistically significantly different. What is happening to the subgroup of the women who are being sexually violated? Not only are they psychologically repelling that aggressor, the rapist, but their body is also repelling the rapist's sperm physiologically. In other words, she is sending some kind of chemicals to her body subconsciously to her womb to reject that perm, to make her, 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 her reproductive tract inhospitable to that aggressor sperm. It's amazing and it's physiological, all right? And so you see, physiology and psychology are together. And those are the two extremes. The subgroup of women who have been sexually violated, are, their, their fertility rate is much lower than the general population. And in contrast to that, couples who have all the physiologically correct uh, for having children don't get pregnant because they're desiring that child too much. Hmm? And so there's a whole range of advice here and I'm not a doctor, I'm not giving advice, but I'm just illustrating academically what a couple, a couple who is seeking to have children needs to think about and put everything in perspective. Because also I remember one time reading uh, one book that made a lot of sense. It says really, if the, if the man is waiting, is holding onto intercourse uh, until the woman is ovulating, that may be a plus or a minus because the best sperm is also the fresh sperm, the most fresh sperm. So it may be that actually it enhances his potency to have regular intercourse instead of just concentrating his activity uh, when she's ovulating. Because on average, the, the most potent sperm is the most fresh sperm. So if he's emptying out and producing new sperm, you know, every day or two days, then that's the better chance of, of, um, of um, fertilizing for the couple who is having difficulty, All right? So you see, NFP is just one layer of it, but NFP actually gets the couple into thinking in these terms of the deeper issue of the desire for children, 
And at the end of the day is to let it go and let God, that little phrase, let go and let God. Let God take over. Uh, they have the desire for children, just act normally as husband and wife, and then God will do the rest because it could be that this couple wants children a lot and God doesn't want this couple to have children for some whatever, whatever mysterious reason. And it takes a lot of humility to accept that. It takes a lot of humility for an infertile couple or for a couple who cannot have children to accept God's will. But maybe it is God's will that they don't have children. It's a tremendous act of surrender and humility to the Almighty, and that's why he's God. Stem cell research and human cloning. We have to make a distinction. We have to make two levels of distinction with regards to uh, stem cells, which is uh, between human and non-human, and also cloning, the same argument. Are we talking about cloning a sheep, Dolly, or are we talking about cloning a human? Bioethically, it makes a difference. Biologically, it makes no difference because mammalian model, mammalian cloning in the lab is the same technique is a nuclear transfer. It's a somatic cell nuclear transfer, SCNT is called. Somatic cell nuclear transfer for cloning a mammal in the lab. It's the same technique for a cow, a sheep, a human, a pig, or a dog, or a cat, all right? But bioethically, I hope you understand, your intuition tells you, whereas we may be able to clone a cattle, we should not clone humans, whereas consent of that human to be cloned, <laughs> right? All right, so the, the, we have to make, uh, with regards to stem cells, uh, we have to make two levels of distinction. The first one is between human and non-human. And the second level for stem cells is whether we're talking about embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells, okay? Because we all have adult stem cells in our bodies and it doesn't kill anyone to get adult stem cells, but it kills the embryo to get embryonic stem cells. And so that's the big ethical difference. All right, so the first level is human and non-human. Here we're talking about human stem cell research. And here then the two levels, embryonic or adult. So to the embryonic, embryonic stem cell, human embryonic stem cell research. Where do these cells come from? Well, they come from the ICM. And that's why I made emphasis early on in the stages of embryonic development. First stage always being the Stages of embryonic development. The first stage always being the zygote. <laughs> yeah, by the basics. I know I talk a lot. It's hard to follow the gap. I know it's hard to follow the gap because I'm just spelling it out. Okay, the zygote, second stage, little tiny berries, modula, the modula, the modula. Okay, but remember all the blastomeres, each blastomere is a cell, are undifferentiated, they're all totipotent, they all are the same, the blastomere. That's why one can pluck out a blastomere from a morula and the morula continues to grow like nothing happened. It's amazing. I just ended up, I reverted back to a zygote because <laughs> that blastomere has full potential. Anyway, third stage of embryonic development, blastula. The blastula. After the morula, the morula continues to subdivide. Remember mitosis? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. At that point, the cells are getting smaller individually because they're sharing their cytoplasm. And the ball begins to hollow out inside, a hollow ball. And then there's an inner mass of cells that develops on the inside of the ball. Think of a tennis ball, but instead of being air, is fluid, it's mostly water, right? Because mm, there's no air in there. Uh, inside on the inner lining, a little mass of cells develops, a little clump, a little bump, and that's the inner cell mass, unimaginatively called the ICM, inner cell mass. And then the outer layer cell, the, the trophoblast, remember? What does the trophoblast become? Think of it functionally. Where is the trophoblast in contact? That implantation is contact with what? Yes, exactly. Remember the blastocyst after hatching, after hatching, remember the hatching? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm amazed that we hatched. <laughs> after hatching, 
right? And leaving the cumulus behind, the corona radiata and the zona pellucida. Now the little embryo works his or her way to the uh, walls of the of the uterus and embeds himself herself into the endometrium. And the one, the contact, the closest physical contact, closest from the embryonic cells to the mother cells, is the trophoblast, right? The outer layer, which becomes the placenta, the placenta. And the ICM becomes the embryo, the embryo proper. So the ICM becomes the embryo in human and in non-human, because I'm just talking biology here. This is mammalian biology, okay? So the embryonic whale came out from a microscopic ICM inside of mama whale as a blastocyst, <laughs> mammal. All right. So where do the embryonic stem cells come from? The embryonic stem cells come from the ICM. They are the ICM. And so this is what happens in the lab. A technician has to go into this blastocyst, suck out the ICM, put it on a Petri dish, which is not blank like this one, has nutrient mimicking the inner environment of the womb, of the endometrium, because that's where the ICM grows, right? On a nutrient, uh, on a nutrient uh, medium. And the ICM is put there. And then these cells are further manipulated into becoming, attempting to become specialized, differentiated cells in the body. Liver, brain, uh, you know, kidneys, whatever. We have about 220 different cell lines in the body, all right? And the idea back then was to develop about 80 or 90 of the 220, 200 cell lines that we have in the body to be able to replace every organ and tissue in the body that would eventually become injured or diseased with the embryonic stem cells, okay? So you see that the embryonic stem cells are, mm, oh, cell potency, sorry. So let me stay here for a moment. The embryonic stem cells are the inner cell mass. Now, when I take this out, when I take the ICM out of a out of a blastocyst, what I do to the blastocyst? I destroy the blastocyst. I kill the embryo. Now, of course, are these technicians going into women's womb and pulling out uh, blastocysts that are implanting in into women's wombs? Absolutely not. Where do they get the the um, the blastocysts? The leftovers. The leftover embryos. Leftover embryos, leftover humans. It's like you go to the supermarket and here's a section for humans, you know? <laughs> Baby humans, which one do you want? Right. These are the spare embryos cryopreserved in clinics throughout the U.S. and the whole world. Right now, in the U.S. alone, it's well over a million human embryos frozen in these tanks. And these are the ones that the clinics now have found, the, the IVF clinics have found, an alternative to get rid of those embryos, right? So remember when we talked about in vitro, the couple did the in vitro, now they have their babies, but she has uh, eight more embryos stored. What do we do with the embryos? I'm not gonna have nine babies. I'm not gonna implant eight more, right? They have to pay a monthly fee, an annual fee to keep them there, cryopreserve. At some point, what do we do with the embryos? You know, flush them down the toilet, in the clinic or send them to a biohazard bag to be incinerated or don't worry because now the clinic says to the couple you can donate your embryos listen to the word speak listen to the language you can donate your embryos to medical research and maybe your embryos someday will cure cancer this is the double speak this is the language this is the wordsmithing all right in and all reality, we are donating it to the clinic 
then is the clinic itself doing the research or are they selling it back? To no, they sell it because the clinic has enough in their hands to do the for, to do the fertility thing, so the, the in vitro. So the donating is you donating it to them to give them the permission to sell it. Yes. No, but they not, cannot sell it because that would be human trafficking. <laughs> so they, the clinic, the IVF clinic donates the embryo to a lab who is doing embryonic stem cell research. Okay, like in California, for example, and other parts of the US and the world. Uh, they donate, the, so the IVF clinic donates the embryo to the research lab. But the clinic, the IVF clinic, is also entitled to monetary compensation for generating the embryo to begin with and for crime preserving the embryo, all the technology that they have invested on the embryo. That's just compensation. But that's, the, that's not part of the compensation that the couple is paying, or are you saying? That not at all. The couple is donating their embryo to cure the cancer of the world. <laughs> whatever, so whatever, once the couple donates, whatever is being cryopreserved and being sent to, then the laboratory that is receiving that donation is paying for that cryopreservation, that whole process. Exactly. It's paying so for the process. Money involved. It's just... Exactly. Follow the money, right? Follow the money. And of course, the clinic is going to have market price, right? right. So it takes it takes three dollars just to throw out a number. It takes three dollars of liquid nitrogen to change right. to change the, the nitrogen in the tank, you know. But that technique costs three thousand dollars because of the markup of the personnel, the overhead, salaries, pensions, etc., etc., etc. And you mark it up because they're, uh, that's the market price. So that would be business costs. Exactly. Sold. Exactly. <laughs> Cost of goods sold. Exactly. How much did it take to produce the Coca-Cola bottle? Right. Exactly. And that's market economy. And so these labs pay the uh, the clinic compensation money. This is we're not buying them. The ember has been donated. Here's all the documentation. Ten ten pages of documentation that this ember has been donated to this lab. <laughs> the difference is impossible. A couple who because I want to prior preserve indefinitely compared to the cost of goods right. that the receiving laboratory yeah. pays. Yeah. I think yeah. it's about, uh, I've heard about two to $400 maybe a year to cry preserve them, you know, mm -hmm. which is not that much. But after five, 10, 20 years, that starts building up, you know, and why are we paying for those embryos if now we're in our 60s and we're, gonna, we're not going to implant those embryos again? So that's why the snowflakes make sense. But again, it's a two-edged sword also because now the clinic can have another alternative, right? So plan A is to implant your embryos, your spare embryos. Plan B is to give them for research. Plan C, oh, you can give them to snowflakes because now a couple who, like you, couldn't conceive, now they can have their baby, right? Yes, to an to for a couple. But what are we doing in the meantime? We're providing more and more excuses for the in vitro to continue to flourish. <laughs> And to have all kinds of options, right? Ethical and unethical to continue the practice. So unwittingly, we are uh, helping the industry. You can tell that I'm not too in favor of in vitro fertilization industry, all right? And, uh, and uh, some have actually been nasty to me because uh, they differ totally from all this. They think they're saving lives and saving souls and they're giving life to couples who couldn't have children at a price. But it's totally different because utilitarian and principal ethics will never really meet as long as we justify the means or not, all right? So anyway, the embryonic stem cells do come from the ICM, which means destroying the human embryo. And that's why in principle, we are opposed to embryonic stem cell uh, research. If there were some way, somehow, to obtain a few cells from the ICM without killing the embryo and developing cell lines that are uh, known as uh, immortal cell lines, okay, in the lab, then theoretically we would be in favor because it's about healing people who could be healed with these cell lines. But at the practical level, we just don't see how we can take out. Think about it logistically. You'd have to throw out the embryo, take out just a few of these ICM cells. Imagine the technique involving that. 
without damaging, you have to puncture the, the embryo, you have to compromise the trophoblast, et cetera. What about if the fluid leaks, uh, then it's gonna collapse. You know, functionally, it just doesn't work to take out a few cells from the ICM and maintaining the integrity, guaranteeing the integrity of, of the whole blastocyst and then freeze him or her again for a future possible implantation, not gonna so work. I'm sorry, we're not, we're not taking from your- Borella. Because not, remember, exactly. Pre-implantation right. means pre-implantation before right. the morella, before the blastocyst. It's at the morella stage when they are totally, where they're still pluripotent, uh, totipotent. And so, uh, totipotent zygote, totipotent morella, meaning that each cell has the full potential to become any organ or tissue of the body. By the time we get to the blastocyst, we already have the first level of cellular differentiation, okay? Which is the trophoblast and the ICM. Trophoblast is the surrounding, is, is the outer layer, and the ICM is the inner cell mass, what becomes the embryo. So you see the ICM will not become placenta, the trophoblast will not become an embryo. And so we have the first level of cellular differentiation. And that's why they're called pluripotent and no longer totipotent, right? Because totipotent is that every cell has a full potential to become the whole human being. And this is standard for any mammal, all right? This is just biology. Pluripotent is also the gastrula with the three layer, three germ layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. By the time we get to the baby, all right, to the newborn, the cells are already multipotent. Multipotent means that they're, they, the stem cells, these are technically already adult stem cells, okay? Once the baby's born, these adult stem cells are within a particular organ system, a particular organ system, all right? And that they are multipotent. We have adult stem cells. If I get a cut on my arm, and I clean it and leave it alone, that wound will heal from the inside out. It will make new dermis, new epidermis, right? New tissue. Where does that new epidermis come from? That new epidermis comes from stem cells inside the adipose tissue, mostly the fat tissue, of uh, conjunctive tissue in between the dermis and the muscle tissue, which is the next one down, all right? So we have stem cells in our body. They're being uh, discovered more and more. Mm. And, uh, and they regenerate tissue that is uh, damaged, but it's mostly within the particular organ system. We don't switch you know, from digestive stem cells into brain stem cells or something like that. They're within their particular system. And so those are multipotent. The, the final stage of uh, cell potency is what is known as fully differentiated cells. Most of the cells in our body are fully differentiated except for the stem cells, which are, sorry, a little typo there, uh, which are the stem cells, which are multipotent, right? Okay, so in contrast, uh, as a healthy alternative to the embryonic stem cells that involve killing a human embryo, adult stem cells don't kill anyone. What do we need to obtain adult stem cells? Consent. Consent. As long as we consent, we can consent to giving stem cells. All right. And so these are ASCs instead of ESCs, embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells. And they are multipotent, not pluripotent. Also, yes, I'm going to go over for a little while, maybe about a half an hour or so. Uh, they're also. Um, you can do autologous transplant. Autologous transplant is uh, very exciting because it bypasses the immune system. In other words, um, you've heard of, uh, the most common one is uh, for, for burn uh, victims. They take one part of the body on skin and sometimes even for weeks or months, they'll have the arm attached to the leg <laughs> so that uh, wherever the burn is, the burn was on the, on the arm, they'll grow leg, epidermis or leg, uh, um, yeah, uh, skin into the arm, 
all right, into the burnt arm. And uh, part of that involves stem cells. And of course, it's an autologous transplant because it's from the same body and there's no immune rejection. So that's a good thing. Whereas with the embryonic stem cells, the stem cells necessarily come from another body, from the embryo. And so there will be an immune rejection, <laughs> right? In fact, theoretically, these are the gold standard. The embryonic stem cells are the gold standard because theoretically, since they come from the ICM, which makes the whole embryo, in principle, one can develop the whole 220 cell lines that make up the human body from an ICM, from, a, from, a, uh, uh, from the embryo. <clears throat> But in practice, <clears throat> what happens is that when these ICMs are injected into an injured mammal, the typical, the guy that gets it is the rat or the mouse in the lab, right? They've done experiments where they take a, a follow, the, follow the, the sequence. You take a female rat, rats because they're a little bigger than mouse, and so it's easier to do the experiment. So you take a female rat who was raised in the lab, you uh, um, extract the egg, do the in vitro fertilization, and now you have a blastocyst rat, okay, which is 50% compatible with her mom. You take out the ACM, and in the meantime, after you've done the, uh, the, the egg extraction for the rat, okay, then you sever the spinal cord of the rat partially, not total sever of the spinal cord, partial, just to make her um, paraplegic so that she cannot uh, walk with her hind legs. So she has to drag with her front leg. I know it sounds gruesome, but it's an experiment, hopefully to heal uh, people with spinal cord injury, of which I, I have a friend who's uh, quadriplegic. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the point is that a clinical trial, so, Paralyzing a rat in a lab may be ethically justifiable if we find a cure for spinal cord injury on humans, okay? Because spinal cord injuries do happen. The motorcycle guys who are racing at three in the morning. So uh, the, the rat don't, uh, gave the, the eggs, the in vitro was done. Now we have the embryonic um, stem cells from that rat, so this embryo is at least is 50% compatible with the mother rat, right? Then the rat is injured partially on the spinal cord, becomes paraplegic, meaning that her hind leg, she's paralyzed from the hip down, means that she drags herself all around. Not necessarily painful, not necessarily painful, but awkward, of course. Eventually this rat is gonna be euthanized, right? But then they inject the ICM right on the side of injury. They inject the, the stem cells right there on the site of injury to see if the injury is um, is bridged, right, and healed. Well, not only is the injury not necessarily healed, but the first thing that happens is that typically she grows a tumor where the embryonic stem cells were injected. Even though the embryo is 50% compatible with her genetically, she'll grow a tumor. Why? It makes sense because these cells are pluripotent. In other words, they have too much potential. They tend to grow the whole embryo on the side of injury or the side of injection is the whole embryo tries to grow there because it's the whole embryo that we're injecting in there. You know, it's embryonic stem cells. So really embryonic stem cells, they have too much potential. And it's again, it's a dog chasing his own tail. They are in principle or, or theoretically rather the gold standard embryonic stem cells for healing. But in practice, they actually have too much potential. And to this day, thanks be to God, of the trials that have done in mammals, typically they fail. And in some human trials that were beginning to start in California with some kind of, um, um, I think it was, imagine, uh, retinal detachment. It wasn't even anywhere close to something vital, okay? to do the trial, to do the clinical trial on retinal detachment, to get FDA approval. I think it was Geron. Geron is one of the first biotechs that appeared in the US, maybe in their 70s or something like that, or 1980s. And there's a, I mentioned California because there was a Proposition 8 or 72 that 
uh, funded millions of dollars, millions of state money uh, taxes to fund embryonic, human embryonic stem cell research back then, all right? That was maybe in the 90s or no, it was 2000. Anyway, it's a big campaign for or against. The point is that uh, these trials have been done and thanks be to God, they fail because it turns out that these embryonic stem cells just have too much potential. So really we're getting success with the adult stem cells. More success because they're toned down. They're more down to particular organs and systems of the body that uh, give more success on the practical level. So what's happening now is that over time, uh, because this has been going on for more than 20 years now, is that adult stem cells are having more success clinically. And so embryonic stem cells are going by the wayside, not used, not because of the ethics involved, because these this utilitarian people couldn't care less, it's to follow the money. There's no profit in it, there's no results. Clinical trials, the FDA will not approve when there's too much uh, risk. Uh, you start growing a tumor in the eye because of the embryonic stem cells, right? And so, therefore, um, they're being put on the side, not because of principal ethics, but simply because they're not working, the embryonic. It's a good thing because uh, the result is that the embryos are being left alone, <laughs> the human embryos, okay? But adult stem cells are very promising, like I say. Basically, it just requires consent. And uh, researchers are discovering an increasing number of sources of stem cells in our bodies, including adipose tissue. So I tell, I tell my students, just in general, uh, moment of levity uh, for your next liposuction, save the fat because they may have a lot of stem cells in it. <laughs> Induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs. This is another one that you see in the literature, Yamanaka. Chindri Yamanaka. Yamanaka was a researcher, is a researcher in Japan who was doing human embryonic stem cell research. And at one point, he was extracting the human embryos. Uh, uh, he was extracting the ICMs from the human embryos uh, in his lab and so forth. Okay. And at one point, he said, looking at the microscope and trying to extract the ICM from human embryos, these embryos look very much like my daughters looked when they were that age, okay? Now, this is an honest guy. This is an honest guy. And I remember this so vividly because he was in the 2000s, uh, somewhere between 2000 and 2004, that what I was doing my, I was doing my doctorate at, uh, in genetics at Purdue. And I remember hearing it in the news. These little embryos look very similar to how my daughters look when they were that age. And so he said, there has to be an alternative. There has to be an ethical alternative because he realized at that moment that he was killing human embryos, okay? And so the alternative was to do this. What if we take differentiated cells, fully differentiated cells, and try to backtrack them, go against nature, go against, to undifferentiate them back to a pluripotent state, but not totipotent, not totipotent. In other words, what he was saying functionally, what was, he was saying, What if we go back and we take cells that are differentiated? Well, basically backwards here, which is totally against nature. It's contra natura because differentiation naturally is only in one direction, right? It's from totipotent eventually to fully differentiated cells. What if we reverse this process? Because this is all regulated by regulatory genes a cascade of regulatory genes kicking in the differentiation process. What if we reverse this? So the race was on. Several labs throughout the world started researching what are the regulatory enzymes or the regulatory proteins or factors that are regulating the process of cellular differentiation. And what if we could reverse this process? 
And sure enough, it came down to four proteins, four proteins that are involved in the process. And if those proteins are manipulated in different ways, at different stages, one can actually take differentiated cells like human fibroblasts, which become typically muscle, and undifferentiated back to a pluripotent state, essentially as if they were more or less stage cells, and then redifferentiate them into nerve cells or bone cells or skin cells, other organs of the body. It's amazing, but it's true. Okay, so he's taking fully differentiated cells back to the pluripotent state, but notice pluripotent, not totipotent, because he doesn't want to create an embryo <laughs> going backwards. He doesn't want to end up in the morla or the zygote. Okay, he wants to end up at the blastocyst stage. So I, I misspoke earlier, I said moral. No, to the blastocyst stage, to the ICM stage, all right? But it, it's induced, that's why the lowercase i, because they're induced, it's done artificially in the lab by manipulating the factors, the regulatory uh, proteins that, that are involved in the regulatory genes that differentiate cells. And he did that, he did it with myoblasts, and he undifferentiated them and then redifferentiated them in other cell lines. All right? For that, he got the normal price. Uh, and he did it. He was working with his team almost 24 7 because other labs of the world were on it too, and the race was off. And whoever would hit it first, come up with those four factors, they got the price. And he did it. And he was inspired by that, by making the ethical question. I'm killing human embryos. Is there an alternative? And there is, uh, but it's uh, it's induced, and so they can be used for research. But you know, the manipulation of the factors may have some influence on the actual cell lines that are developed. So, to my knowledge, those cell lines have never actually reached clinical trial. In other words, try testing some of these induced cell lines into actual human beings. They may still be at the animal trial, but at least it can be used for research for the differentiation process, you know, undifferentiating and redifferentiating. There's a lot of, of, um, of um, cascades that need to occur there. So they're good at least for studying those processes, even if it never reaches actual clinical trials. In the meantime, enter the umbilical cord cells. Umbilical cord cells. Okay, so what do we have? We have the baby, we have the placenta, and we have the umbilical cord, the tube that connects the two, right? That umbilical cord is full of blood, cord blood, umbilical cord blood, right? It's baby blood. And therefore, uh, it's pristine, it's uh, very, very uh, young, fresh, uh, plastic dynamic, and there are stem cells in there. they are few, they are not a lot, but there are stem cells that come from the baby and are in the baby's blood, and therefore they are also in the umbilical cord blood because that blood is mostly the baby blood. There are some mother cells that go into the baby, and there are some baby cells that actually go through the placenta into the mother also, so there is that fantastic dynamic there. That's a separate issue. The point is that cord blood contains stem cells that are almost embryonic quality in the sense that they're very plastic, they're young, they're fresh, they're pristine. You know, they haven't been exposed to a lot of uh, insults like chemicals or toxins or, or uh, uh, UV or anything like that. Once we're born and we walk around in sunlight, we're being bombarded by UV, UV all the time. And so they're called mesenchymal stem cells. MSCs, mesenchymal, and they can produce a number of different organs, all right? So those are the cord blood cells. Mm -hmm. Now, ethical or not ethical? To keep the cord blood cells? Yeah, I mean, to yeah. save them, to store them, to co co collect them, first of all, start with collecting. Does it kill the embryo? No, it doesn't kill the embryo because the baby is born. <laughs> so the embryo, the, em the baby is fine in mother's arms, okay? Now the cord blood normally goes into medical waste to, to incinerate, but the stem cells are good 
and could save the life of that baby when that baby grows up and has an injury, he or she has stem cells stored and preserved, which will be cryopreserved the same way that the other embryos are being stored in cryopreservation, okay? It does take some money to preserve them. And as far as I know, to this day, insurance, insurance is not covering it yet. So that's a deterrent, especially for young couple who are struggling with the finances and they may not have enough money. First, the procedure itself, they actually buy the kit online and then take it to the delivery and tell the nurse ahead of time and the doctor, we want to preserve the stem cells. Here's the kit, we bought it online, it's all sterilized. What you do, nurse, please, once the cord is out, uh, collect the blood, put it into the vial and send it to the lab for cleansing and purification so that only the stem cells are saved, all right? And cryopreserved. But that's a good source of stem cells that is ethical as long as the baby cannot consent, but who consents? The parents on behalf of the baby, you know? So it's all ethical, legal, it has financial implications. Like I say, to my knowledge, insurance doesn't cover it yet, but it's a, yeah, it's a possibility, okay? So umbilical cord cells, is another possibility. Cloning. Uh, this diagram again is, uh, but this actually shows the technique. Oh, it's not accurate. So cloning, again, the difference between human cloning or non-human cloning. Basically here we're talking about human cloning, all right? Should it be done, should it not be done? So it can be done for two purposes, either for re reproductive purposes or for the therapeutic purposes. So this is looking at cloning functionally. Listen to what I'm saying. This is looking at cloning functionally, not structurally. Structurally is the same technique, all right? The structure, in other words, the material, the matter that's involved, which is cells, uh, is the same technique. Functionally is the purpose for which it's done. So it can be done either for reproduct reproductive purposes, in other words, creating, manufacturing, generating a baby in a lab for a couple or a single person, that'll be reproductive cloning. Or generating, manufacturing an embryo in a lab up to, uh, to generating a zygote in a sense, in essence, and incubating that zygote through the moral lab into the blastocyst stage, to then procure the embryonic stem cells to do the embryonic stem cell research, and that would be therapeutic cloning. Okay, but the technique is the same for both. So let's look at the technique. And here's you've been familiar with this before, with a little uh, photo. In this case, mm, it's uh, this is uh, uh, what we have in in the tube here. Is not a sperm like in the previous time of uh, ICSI, right? Intracytoplasmic sperm injection. No, this one is now a nucleus. This is a nucleus, all right? And it's a nucleus that's been injected into an enucleated egg. So this is an, uh, an egg that has been held by the, the suction there. And this egg has been enucleated. So the pronucleus has been taken out. And here comes a somatic nucleus, a diploid nucleus that is being injected into an enucleated egg. What happens when I take an egg, an ovum, take out its pronucleus, and now inject a somatic nucleus, right? What have I done? I have created what? A zygote without fertilization, because now I have an egg with a somatic nucleus, which is the end product of fertilization, right? Remember syngamy is restored in the pleiotic. So this does functionally does the same thing, but without fertilization. And what's the key? The key is that the nucleus, obviously, well, it could be from the same mother, from the same woman who gave the egg, or it could be from another woman or man, same species to have the proper results, but the, the egg is somatic egg, is diploid. And so it's bringing the full complement of chromosome pairs to the egg, which is basically just the, the shell, you know, it's just the, the habitats 
where that nucleus then is going to progress into mitosis and generate an embryo. Okay, so it's what we call technically, the big word is somatic cell nuclear transfer. SCNT is the acronym, somatic cell nuclear transfer. Okay, it's the nucleus of a somatic cell, which is what do I mean by somatic cell? Somatic cell, in contrast to gamete, in other words, diploid. Somatic cell is any cell from the soma. The soma is the body. Any cell of the body, a skin cell, a liver cell, a brain cell, any cell of the body of the soma is a somatic cell. And it's diploid by definition because only the gametes are haploid, right? Okay. So the nucleus of a somatic cell is transferred into an enucleated ovum. So what am I using from the ovum? The cytoplasm and all the machinery for making proteins and for metabolizing in the cytoplasm, right? And just replacing the nucleus. So it's also a nuclear swap or a nuclear transfer. So you see SCAT, sometimes you see also NT, nuclear transfer. So where would you the somatic cell from? Anywhere. It could be the same woman who, do, who donated the egg. And then that child, if it's done, follow, follow the logic. Let's say it's a woman who wants to have a child through cloning. All right, so, and she's going to donate her own nucleus. <laughs> so she, she donates the egg or she, they extract the egg, a nucleate her ovum. Then they take a skin cell and take the nucleus of that skin cell because it's a somatic nucleus and insert it into her a nucleated ovum. I have just created what? A clone identical to the mother because they're bizarre. It's not illegal. It's not illegal. But they can create, they can clone themselves. In other words, what I'm saying is that now women can clone themselves. Men still depend on the zygote of the woman for cloning, on, on the egg of the woman for cloning, but the whole nucleus. Dr. He do that, did that in China, do that, <laughs> yes, do that. <laughs> Dr. He did that in China last year. Uh, he claimed he had flown Lulu and Nana. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, yeah, Lulu and Nana, right? And he did engineering in the process. So anyway, I'm just describing the technique now first. Just got to go baby steps here, guys, okay? Baby steps, because this gets from bizarre to bizarre. The fact is that the technique can be done in the lab. And it was done in the lab with Dolly. Remember Dolly? Okay, so Dolly was uh, the sheep that was cloned by Ian Wilmot. Here's Ian Wilmot and Dolly. Okay, 96, uh, uh, the Roslin in Scotland, Roslin Institute. What did he do? He took a sheep and took a, a um, well, let's start with the egg here, sorry. Took a, this obviously has to be a female. I think she, she's called an ewe, right? E-W-E, ewe, a ewe, <laughs> ewe sheep. <laughs> it's, a, it's a female sheep. Uh, took an egg, an ovum from this ewe, enucleated the egg. In other words, took out the nucleus. Now we just got the cytoplasm, the cytoplasmic uh, ovum, right? Then he took the um, a cell, from another sheep, yes, it was from another sheep, didn't want to use the same sheep because uh, did not want to create. Uh, so if if he had taken the cells from the same sheep, from the same you who donated the egg, this, uh, yeah, it's cloning itself, but he wanted to prove the principle that it could be done with a donor nucleus that did not come from the U, that did not have the full genetic compatibility of, of, uh, of uh, sheep number one. I don't know how to call these, <laughs> to not get them confused. Let's say that the U who donated the egg is sheep number one. The one who donates the nucleus is sheep number two. In other words, a separate individual. And this sheep number two can either be male or female because we just, all we need is a diploid nucleus. So the diploid nucleus could be either male or female, right? No, no problem. 
so he wanted to prove that it could come from another individual of the same species. So he used a different uh, individual, a different sheep. And it's important for the name that this cell was an epidermal cell, right? And it came from the udder of the other you. So it had to be a female. The other one had to be a female to have udder. What is the udder? The udder is the mammary gland of mammals, okay? Like a cow udder, that's what gets milked. All right. So for important reasons, that's, well, for the name reason, that's where it came, the cell came from. Epidermal cell of the udder, of the mammary gland of this uh, sheep number two. And of course, that nucleus was taken and inserted through this technique into the enucleated ovum of sheep number one, right? What do we do? Now we have a zygote. In other words, we have an ovum with a diploid nucleus. By definition, that's a zygote. Single cell, diploid, zygote, right? In fact, now they don't even bother to take out the nucleus. They just insert the whole cell. The whole cell, no problem. You know, whatever the the um, cytoplasm of the ovum doesn't like, it's going to digest away. But the important thing is that the nucleus remains intact. Okay, so now we have an ovum. We have, sorry, we no longer have an ovum. We have a zygote who is diploid by definition that was made of two individuals with no fertilization. This is crucial, no fertilization, okay? Then what's gonna happen for, to that zygote? From then forward, it's mitosis until death. So from the zygote to the morula, from the morula to the blastocyst, from the blastocyst implantation back into U number one, because it's the most likely resident for that embryo to take since the ovum came from her, right? So now they're looking at cytoplasmic compatibility and also prove a principle that foreign or, or donor nucleus can implant. So the nucleus, what's the nuclear compatibility? I know we're in the same species, but I'm talking about variation with the same species, okay? What's the nuclear compatibility, nuclear DNA compatibility with uh, sheep one? How about 0%? In other words, this nucleus comes from where? From sheep number two, which is her own genotype, right? So sheep number one has her genotype, sheep number two has her genotype. Yes, the same genome because they're both sheep, the same species, but at the level of SNPs and all the other fingerprinting and markers of the genotype, that's why the embryo, normal fertilized embryo is 50% compatible, 50% incompatible, right? So this DNA is 0% compatible with sheep number one because it comes 100% from sheep number two. And yet it implanted, okay? But not at the first trial. It took about 250 trials to get one to implant. So it was not at the first trial. It was about 250 trials. Finally, one blastocyst finally implanted. So imagine how many sheep and how many embryos he had to go through and went through gestation and little Dolly was born, okay? So Dolly was born and then they had to wait for proof of principle, which was for Dolly to grow up enough to be mated. And of course, being a non-human, she was mated and she gave her offspring and the principle was proved that a mammal can be cloned, all right, in woman. So there is a proof that a mammal can be cloned and essentially in the lab, except for some technical difficulties, like why was the dog took a long time to, to clone the dog was one of the last ones. Uh, so Dolly was the first cloned sheep. Copycat was the first uh, cloned cat. <laughs> uh, cattle has been cloned, uh, horses have been cloned. 
the dog was one of the toughest to clone because it was very difficult to get to time precisely the ovulation of a female dog. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to time the ovulation of, to get a female egg, to get a female ovum from a dog is difficult for, I don't know why, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it was what I, but many animals have been cloned, many mammals. And the technique in the lab essentially is the same, is somatic nuclear transfer or nuclear swap for short. All right, it's a nuclear swap, right? Then if it's used for reproductive cloning, here's a diagram. Woman donates the egg, enucleates, then either herself or another woman or man donates the donor diploid cell, somatic cell, right? And now we have the zygote, morula, blastocyst implanted, and nine months later, the woman will have her baby. You can see that the donor, the somatic nucleus can come from anyone in principle. It could be herself, her husband, her girlfriend, uh, a catalog fellow, you know, from buying a cell from somebody. You see? But that's that's when it's used for the purpose of creating or manufacturing a baby in the lab and getting a woman a child. Mm -hmm. One can have up to four or five children, four or five parents with this case. So you can have the woman who donated the egg, the other person who donated the um, the nucleus, then the other the other woman who just stated the uh, the pregnancy, and then the couple who was trained for the whole procedure. <laughs> So you can end up with maybe five parents as a clone. And the clone is going to be identical to whom? The nucleus, whoever is the donor of the nucleus. Not even the nucleus, not even the donor of the egg of the ovum, <laughs> not the donor of the mother, unless the mother also donated the nucleus. But the clone is going to be identical to the donor of the nucleus, but separated in time. 10, 20, 40, 50 years, right? Chronologically, but identical clone. And how do we obtain consent? How do we know that this human being, which is a baby who was just born out of cloning, wants to be a clone of his dad or her mom uh, with that time differential? We don't know. And how do you obtain consent from a, an embryo? You can't. We can't assume, you know, one thing is to to donate, uh, uh, to consent to embryonic, not to embryonic, but to consent to umbilical cord cells once the baby is safe. Another thing is to put a child through this without his or her consent at all. We just don't have a right to do it. So again, the principle. Reproductive cloning? No. Okay. How about therapeutic cloning? Therapeutic cloning, the same nuclear swap technique, but the embryo is not implanted. The blastocyst is not implanted because this is therapeutic. This is for healing purposes. So the blastocyst is not implanted. Rather, the, the blastocyst is disaggregated so as to obtain the inner cell mass and produce the embryonic stem cells. So therapeutic cloning is used for the purpose of generating blastocysts and generating embryonic stem cells. Now, this is a little historical because it's not being done. It's not, it's not res giving results. So why bother? This is a procedure that you can see is very, very expensive. All this under historical conditions, obtaining consent from all these people. So... Um, now it's historical in view of the success of the adult stem cells, but this would be therapeutic cloning and it's a double negative. Why? And in this case, this double negative does not make a positive. It's not a philosophical double negative. It's an existential double negative, meaning 
No, because it involves in vitro fertilization. And a second no, because it involves this type of cloning is done on purpose to kill the embryo to obtain the stem cells. So it's a double negative. You know, it's not only manufacturing an embryo in a lab, a human embryo, but then it's proceeding to kill that embryo on purpose to obtain the stem cells. You know, so we're basically manufacturing a human being to take and out its organs, its vital organs for somebody else who needs that organ. You know, the need in the organ is a very noble cause. Of course, there's someone who needs a heart. That my friend, I think I told you that it had it was down to 10% of, of heart functioning, you know. Uh, but we're not going to take out a living heart from someone else to put it into my friend's heart, my friend's uh, heart uh, needing a heart, right? So we got to respect the embryo. And that's why uh, on two counts, therapeutic cloning is even worse. It's worse enough reproductive cloning. Uh, therapeutic cloning is double. You're creating a human being, you're manufacturing a human being in the lab just to kill him or her for her stem cells, all right? And even though this is historical now, but these arguments uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were still very much alive. And it would involve um, funding from uh, federal agencies and stuff like that, which would involve our tax money. Last thing is, um, all right, so we've seen embryonic stem cell and how it fills into the cloning issue. Uh, questions or comments about these guys? People are clear. Bottom line is there's been no scientific discovery or advancement on <clears throat> linked to embryonic stem cell research. Correct. That's correct. Thanks, Peter Guy. Because I work. But now, so what's happening? The industry is relentless. They don't give up. So the typical thing with embryonic stem cells is that they produce what? Aside from the immune rejection, because that could be done with immunosuppressors and deal with it, but the typical thing that they produce is they have too much potentiality, they produce tumors, produce tumors, right? Therefore, some labs are saying, ah, we can use embryonic stem cells for what? For tumor research, for cancer research. And so they're finding another avenue of profit, cancer research. So give us your embryos anyway, because we can do cancer research with your embryos. They always find out, you see, when you go into utilitarian, there's no end to it. There's no end to utilitarian because as long as it's not illegal, right? Who are you to prevent the industry from flourishing? And maybe someday they may discover, they may be able to develop a cell line that comes from the embryo. If you try hard enough, I mean, I've been in the lab long enough to tell you, if you give me enough money and enough time, I'll produce whatever result you want. Just give me enough time and enough money and I will manipulate the thing so much. And now with genetic engineering, with CRISPR, where we can change uh, gene sequences and take from one species into another, target it in a, to a particular area, where you combine human cloning, with uh, with CRISPR technique, you can produce just about any resource you want, right? But where's the ethics? The ethics goes down to seeing the human zygote as a human being, as any one of us. The human zygote looks exactly how it's supposed to look when he or she is a zygote. That's how we all look when we were zygotes, <laughs> exactly that way. You know, don't expect to the zygote to have arms and legs and have blue eyes and blonde hair. Give them, give them time, leave them alone, and you'll see the result. Okay, you've been extremely patient with me, uh, but I did want to end a little anecdote because how many of you have heard of Dolly the sheep? Heard about Dolly the sheep? Many people heard about Dolly the sheep, right? Okay, and uh, why Dolly? It's, it's tongue in cheek, okay? Remember I told you, where did the nucleus come from? Sheep number two, right? But specifically, anatomically, where from her body? The other, okay? And so this was a tongue-in-cheek comment of Ian Wilmot, the one who, because it's a reference 
to, I'm paraphrasing his wording, the prodigious mammary glands of Dolly Parton. So at first sight, we laugh, especially the men, but at a deeper level, you know, it's really kind of an insult. Uh, I'm sure Dolly Parton was not consulted <laughs> for, for this. I happen to uh, like Dolly Parton very much as an actress. She did uh, Still Magnolias, if you've ever seen Still Magnolias, okay, great movie. Uh, of three women who fight it out. But anyway, um, that was the thing, the prodigious memory glands of Dolly Parton, and that's how Dolly got her name, the sheep. <laughs> so <laughs> there it is. You know, at some point we become so powerful that we can become arrogant, right? And uh, that was the first clone mammal, and it's all historical now. You can go online and research it uh, to your pleasure. Okay, folks, we've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous. So I thank you very much. And uh, next Saturday, God willing, uh, we'll meet again. We'll do the last uh, of this uh, class. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Anyone online, if uh, you people are still there? Thank you. Okay, questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Trophy. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks for hanging in there. And uh, we'll catch up again next, next week. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.